Very, very important, no doubt about that. Then we look at Carlton St Kilda. Interesting game. Carlton just always can sometimes jump up and surprise. And the Saints really aren't travelling that special. They won their last six over the Blues, but a couple of important outs and the likes of Luke Ball, who has been selected but looks pretty sore. So the Blues, after a win last week over Essendon, will go into that one just confident of maybe coming up with... Court slips away on the boundary. Kept it in. High kick to the square. The spectre of club mergers has loomed large over football throughout much of the 1980s. And the VFL is about to turn up the heat, with its crosshairs squarely locked in on Melbourne's west. Footscray's fight for survival. Welcome to Headliners. It's made me more determined than ever to play next year. They've always been the VFL's blue-collar battlers. The sons of the West, fighting the odds in the big end of town for their beloved western suburbs working-class faithful. The Footscray Football Club joined the VFL in 1925, almost 30 years after the league was first created. They entered as the powerhouse side of the VFA, having lost just eight games in five years. But they had to toil for 13 long seasons before making the VFL finals for the first time in 1938 the year in which they officially changed their nickname from the Tricolours to the Bulldogs. It would take 29 years for the Doggies to bring home the game's ultimate success. Their 1954 Premiership side packed with legendary names such as Ted Whitten, Charlie Sutton, Jack Collins, Herb Henderson and Peter Box. But September successes would continue to be few and far between. And by 1988, the Dogs have qualified for the finals just three times in 27 years and are in serious financial trouble. Rumours had abounded of the Bulldogs being forced to relocate to South Australia or Tasmania, and the club had been considering shifting its home games to Princess Park before local lawyer and lifelong Bulldog fan Peter Gordon intervened, launching the Save the Dogs campaign in late 1988. He organises a peaceful on-field demonstration prior to Footscray's last home game. Then arranges a meeting at the Footscray Town Hall the following Monday night. We'll be there if you're prepared to commit, and I mean each and every one of you, the sort of money that I'm talking about. I'd organised that meeting, booked the hall, um, and really had very little idea what would actually happen because um, you know, those days were a lot different to today and there was really no telling how many people would turn up. But it was, in fact, it was absolutely extraordinary because the hall packed out. His simple straight from the heart speech resonates with disenfranchised supporters who are growing increasingly uncomfortable with the corporatisation of their game. The Ross Oakleys and the John Elliotts of this world do not own football. They run it, they run it for the time being and they have no right to run it in a way which is against the interests of ordinary football supporters. And I recall when I was saying it, seeing a guy who I'd never actually spoken to, but I'd seen him on the terraces of, of, of the Western Oval. And as I was saying it, I can remember him standing up and starting to, to clap with a look on his face that, that sort of said, yeah. You know, it was really just, I think it was striking a chord that this is what a lot of people from Footscray felt passionately that had never been articulated before. Gordon's Save the Dogs committee successfully lobbied the club into remaining at the Western Oval and begin working on their strategy for future Bulldog success, which includes plans for the redevelopment of the Barclay Street end of the ground and a meaningful alliance with the Footscray City Council. Two Save the Dogs supporters, Don Gibson and Barry MacDonald, join the like-minded Bob Moody on the Footscray board, who view this new lobby group with a degree of caution. Prominent businessman and racehorse owner Nick Collum takes over the Footscray presidency from Barry Beatty in March of 1989. Collum having returned to the board late the previous year after having served as the club's football director throughout the early 1980s. But Collum and club CEO Dennis Gallamberti have an immediately uneasy working relationship. My working relationship with Dennis Gallamberti was just that. Um, he, he was in the position when I came back onto the board in 88. I wasn't aware of it at the time. I've since been told that there, there was some agitation by him on a constant basis. Uh, he had his agenda. Uh, it didn't suit him to have me there for a lot of reasons. But uh, I can tell you in my period, I kept a very, very close rein on Dennis Gallimberti. He wasn't a person that I liked nor trusted. 
But well beyond any deep-seated personality clash between the President and the CEO is the sobering financial reality facing the club. An independent audit confirms the Footscray Football Club's accumulated debt to be approaching $2 million, with a projected loss of anywhere between $650,000 and $800,000 for the season ahead. Given the club lost more than $429,000 in 1988 and is effectively trading insolvent, the Wolves are well and truly at the door. Well, I'd report to our board meetings and our finance uh, committee and say, well, you know, we're just, uh, the budgets aren't going, being achieved. We're in a, you know, a hell of a big hole now. And, uh, you know, um, I don't know what, uh, what more we can do unless we, you know, generate some serious money in the short term, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, you know, keep trading on that basis. The club always had a history of um, selling off its best players in a, in a quick grab for cash. And um, that sort of practice probably caught up with the club. Players like Brad Hardy, uh, Neil Cordy and others had been sold over the journey in order to try and balance the books. So the team, after the success of 85, the team had become depleted in 87, 88 and 89. And with the depletion of the, of the playing stocks, uh, support uh, had fallen away. Um, Colum came to power on the basis of um, injecting cash into the club and generating corporate support, uh, which didn't transpire. And uh, that really threw the club into some turmoil. We tried every avenue during that period, that year, I went and saw Gallum Birdie gave me a list of, of, of the CEOs and chair people of all of the companies. I think there were 73 companies in the West and I made contact with every one of them, seeking assistance, seeking their involvement, seeking financial support. Let me say we got very little. The facilities had become very run down and uh, the club really didn't have the facilities to attract the corporates and that was always a problem that the club faced, that we could never generate enough corporate support. Gallum Bertie, Colum and Vice President Barry Beatty represent the Bulldogs at the VFL Commission's Hobart Conference in July 1989, where the league formally ups the ante on encouraging a merger between two struggling Melbourne-based clubs. The Commission has been unsuccessfully trying to engineer a merger for four years, since its 1985 strategic blueprint clearly stated that there is no way that Melbourne can afford to sustain 11 teams in the medium to long term. Footscray aren't the only club in financial crisis, with the likes of St Kilda, Richmond, North Melbourne and Fitzroy also fighting to keep their heads above water. There was a presentation from Commissioner Peter Scanlon um, on a whiteboard. Um, and he outlined the vision of the VFL for the merging of two clubs in Victoria. Look, there was no doubt that the VFL um, had a bent at that stage. They, they wanted less clubs in Victoria. I think they saw it as non-financial. There would only be two clubs that would merge. The first two would be the ones that got the deal. So afterwards I met with, with Beatty and, um, and Gallum Bertie. We discussed that presentation. It was decided that it would be prudent for me to go and see Scanlon. I rang Scanlon, I went up to his room that night and I sat with him for half an hour and he went through what would be the process if we were to consider merging. And that was all that happened. We then went back to Melbourne. At the very next board meeting, uh, we put on the table all the things that had been discussed in Tasmania, including the merger prospect. Uh, there was a, um, a motion moved that we should pursue that merger process to investigate the possibilities and the viabilities for the Footscray Football Club. And I was empowered to do that. Now, we subsequently um, did so, and Mike Dudley, who was the development director, that was his portfolio. He and I went and spoke to the VFL about it. Ross Oakley rang and said, how would you like to be the white knight riding over the hill to save a Western District, a Western Suburb Football Club? I said, cut out the bullshit, Ross, a Footscray shot. He said, yeah, they're rooted. <laughs> some, some expression like that. And I thought, oh, well, uh, what's the deal? And he said, well, what could you offer them? It was a merge. So this is off the top of the head, the one conversation. And by the way, this offer was never, ever revisited. The one offer. 
I said, well, I suppose, you know, this is just me talking, but before we go to the board, we could call ourselves the Fitzroy Bulldogs. Uh, we'd compromise the jumpers because they're not that far apart anyway. Um, the point of whether we would train full-time at the Western Oval worried me because that would be just a bit too far away from our base at Fitzroy and I thought we'd move so often, our supporters had to be considered here. So we put this package together which I thought was good. Um, we thought we'd put it up for open discussion as to who would be coach and who would be uh, uh, all the other lead roles that people gauge these things by. Although Fitzroy are in a financial bind themselves, President Leon Wiegard has the impression that Footscray is in far more pressing trouble, on its last legs and about to go under. A good merge would have been equal, like the Melbourne Fitzroy, but this was a case of a club just ready to die, roll over and disappear. So we were going to go, it was a different setup. It was a, a benevolent takeover, if you like. In the interests of keeping the club's options as open as possible, Footscray President Nick Collum and his development director Mike Dudley have been empowered by the board to listen to any informal merger offers that may be floating around. We contacted St Kilda. I don't think I ever met with them. Contacted Richmond and we did meet. Contacted North Melbourne. We did meet and I contacted Melbourne. Now again, I don't know whether there was, I think there were telephone conversations. Now all of these discussions were taken back to our board and reported to the board. And Dennis Gallimberti, as secretary to those meetings, took the minutes. So all of the reports were in the minutes. What he was authorised to do was to investigate what a merger would mean to the club. He was never authorised to go and, and negotiate a merger. All he was asked to do was to go and explore what a merger would mean to the Footscray Football Club. We put nothing on the table because our mindset was we're not keen to merge. We don't want to merge. We want to work our way around this. We, was, we were collaterally working with the Footscray City Council, but we just thought it would be prudent and, and it would be a nonsense not to, but it would, be a, it would be very prudent to pursue this merger option and listen to what they had to say. So we never really went there and said, this is what we want. We went there and said, what have you got? What's your deal? What are you proposing? So particularly at the first meeting, we said nothing. And we walked away, we said, that's all very interesting. Uh, we took it back to our board. Um, the board then, to my recollection, said, well, we should continue to have discussions on all of this, which we did. Specifically my, with Fitzroy? Just with the, with, with the VFL, mm -hmm. with the VFL. I mean, the Fitzroy issue was the VFL's issue. It wasn't us, we didn't choose Fitzroy. They wheeled Fitzroy into us. We didn't say we want to merge with Fitzroy. Leon Wiegard had one view on it, and Mike Dudley and I had another view on it. Leon Wiegard was looking for a takeover, and we made that very clear to him, and to Graeme Samuel, and we were looking for a merger if we were going to do anything. Meanwhile, Bulldog representatives are endeavouring to negotiate a rescue package with the Footscray City Council, who have paid for an independent viability study to be performed on the club. Coopers and Lyle Brown found that um, the club was viable and could continue to represent the people of the West and play out of the Western Oval and that report attached a huge value to the name Footscray and it attached a huge benefit to the council to have a football club in the elite Premier AFL competition bearing the same name of the municipality and that report encouraged the council to invest more money into the football club to ensure that the name of Footscray was perpetuated. There was a tension um, in, in the council between those who wanted to support it and saw the genuine economic and social value to the council in doing so and those who said, well, we're not a rich council anyway, we simply can't afford to, to do it. It was very evident early in the evening, um, although not announced, it was very evident early in the evening that something was going down and that there was uh, something dramatically wrong. Thursday on Fox Footy, expert analysis from two of the game's most respected names, David Parkin and Matthew Lloyd, on White Line Fever. Then, for the latest team lineups and informed football opinion, you can't afford to miss Fox League teams. Slows don't want to cripple the game. 7.30 White Line Fever, 8.30 Fox League teams, live and exclusive Thursday. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. 
Superman Returns tumblers are now landing at Hungry Jack's. Purchase any value meal, and then for $2.50, you'll receive a Superman Returns collectible 3D tumbler. Collect all four, and leap into Hungry Jack's now. Sunday from 2 o'clock, we're live and exclusive from the MCG as the Western Bulldogs battle the Kangaroos. The Bulldogs have been knocked from pillar to post this season, yet keep on finding ways to win. But the Kangaroos will be out to cause an upset and keep the legend of the Shinbona spirit alive. Press red to go Fox 40 active for this clash and put yourself in the director's chair. Your Sunday starts at 2 with the Bulldogs and Kangaroos live and exclusive, followed by Swans Crows, the winner's weekend wrap, then Saints Magpies. Welcome back to Headliners. 1989 has turned out to be another bleak season for the Footscray Football Club. Coach Mick Malthouse walking out the door to join the Eagles after his team finished second last with just six wins. Malthouse's departure adds to the pessimistic gloom already shrouding the Western Oval, as whispers of the club's impending demise begin to gain momentum throughout September. The Bulldogs have held a couple of meetings with Fitzroy to discuss merger possibilities, with the presidents of both clubs adamant that no deal has been agreed to. By grand final eve, Footscray president Nick Collum and CEO Dennis Gallenberti are keen to remind VFL boss Ross Oakley of the rescue package being negotiated with the Footscray City Council in a bid to reinforce their position and buy some additional time to close the deal. I spent the Friday morning with Dennis Gallenberti and, and the lawyer for the Footscray Council. And we were going through all of, all of the possibilities that, that confronted the club. And I made it very clear to the lawyer, whose name I now, now don't remember, um, that we, we were potentially at the crossroads for the club. That merger was, was a distinct possibility given the mood of the VFL. It was decided that we would put a very strong letter to Ross Oakley from the council, jointly council and the club, and that we would deliver that that day, explaining to Oakley that there was still plenty of life left in the negotiations with the council, and there were still plenty of options available to us. And, and I was very bullish about um, the chances of something like that succeeding. He wouldn't allow me to go with him, so I just question um, how persuasive Nick was in that meeting in terms of pushing that package, because I believe it was an attractive package at the full support of the city of Footscray, and it showed where the money was going to come from to fund the club the next season. But Nick later told me that Ross Oakley wouldn't consider the letter and that he basically ripped it up and threw it in the bin. I said, here's a letter I want you to, and I'll talk to you about it tomorrow. At the grand final luncheon, I grabbed him and I said, did you read the letter? Yes, I did. Uh, what did you think of it? Not too sure that uh, it makes too much difference, but I'll let you know, I'll ring you and I'll let you know what our, you know, what our next move is. On the Sunday, we meet with, with Samuel. Mike Dudley and I went to Graham Samuel's home. Uh, Weegard was there and there were designs of jumpers and names and logos, which we didn't like too many of. But I felt so uncomfortable that when I got to the old players function where Gallenberti was, uh, Terry Wheeler was there, I said, Gentlemen, I need to talk to you about something. I've just come from a meeting and I explained the meeting and this is what's been put to me. And I have a grave fear that we're being sent into a cul-de-sac here. We're going into a dead end road. We're not gonna be able to come back from it. What's your view on a potential merger? Gallen Birdie was there. It was no great secret. Terry Wheeler was there. No great secret. Terry Wheeler actually followed me outside afterwards and he said, you're in a bit of pain. I said, yeah, I'm not happy about all of this. I don't know quite what to make of it. So then the next day I get the call from Oakley saying, you better come and see us on the Tuesday. So I had this gut feeling. I said, mate, I'm not coming to see you alone on anything. My whole board has to be there or it's not on. That night coincides with the club's best and fairest presentation at the Cadillac Bar in Carlton. I said to Gallenberti, mate, 
You better tell all the board people that there's a meeting tomorrow. Tell them all. This is my fear. I reckon we're going to be railroaded into a position where we can do nothing other than merge. Exact words. I went around to all of the board people myself and I explained that this was very important, they had to be there. At that point, I believed that we were going in to see the VFL um, about um, this rescue package that we'd put together in conjunction with the city of Footscray. And uh, a director of the club, not Nick Collum, but another director of the club had told me, look, Dennis, we're going into a meeting. There's been a deal done to merge with Fitzroy. We're gonna be known as the Fitzroy Bulldogs from Tuesday onwards. This director told me that the deal had been done and it was two weeks old. And uh, he told me that it was gonna be called the Fitzroy Bulldogs playing out of Princess Park. Um, and in, in, a, in basically a Fitzroy jumper and he gave me sufficient detail for me to believe the deal had already been done. And it took me just a matter of seconds to decide what I had to do, because I just found it absolutely abhorrent that, you know, a hundred years of tradition of a VFL club could just be swept away um, in such an audacious manner and in, in, in such an, an arrogant and, um, and, and even in such a one-sided manner without, you know, the, without the total board being consulted without the senior administrators being consulted, without the members of the club being consulted, that a secret deal could be done like this behind closed doors. So I wasn't in any doubt as to what I should do. You know, even a young kid knows the difference between right and wrong, and that to me was totally wrong. It was very evident early in the evening, um, although not announced, it was very evident early in the evening that something was going down and that there was uh, something dramatically wrong. And all of a sudden, you know, you got a sense of, this is a bigger night than just a, a best and fairest night. Uh, something is about to unfold here. And we obviously, we found out that uh, fairly quickly afterwards and uh, Dennis Gallimberti being the one to, uh, to, to pass the message on. The word that we got that night was that the club was gonna merge with Fitzroy. There's been some meetings uh, behind closed doors and uh, it was certainly on. And I must admit, it was really, the initial uh, thought was just shock. I thought, gee whiz, I mean, I played all my career, particularly talking about myself, playing at the Bulldogs, always only one jumper player. And um, here I am now, it looks like the, the club's gone, we're gonna merge with Fitzroy. We've all just sort of stood in shock, to tell you the truth. I remember standing at the bar, at the Cadillac bar, uh, with Terry Wheeler, and we were both sitting there, standing there having a beer going, this, this isn't happening, this can't be right. I, I want my kids to barrack for the dogs. They can't get rid of them. We can't go. Dennis Gallimberti is by now already on his way back to his Western Oval office with former club marketing manager, Brooke Anderson. I uh, fervently believe that the club did have a future in its own right. Um, I knew that I had to disclose uh, this merger as soon as I possibly could. We faxed off details of the of the letter to the city of Footscray which outlined how the club could continue in its own right and then I telephoned Mike Stevens at the Herald Sun who was a, a passionate Footscray supporter and gave him an outline of what I believe was about to occur. I think it went to air on the 3AW News at about 9pm and uh, then I rang Peter Gordon uh, to tell him what was about to occur uh, to urge him to form a reform group to take control of the club. Dennis ran off to, to tell people, I thought, but the next thing I know, he was gone. And then I'm driving home and I hear on the radio that the general manager of the Footscray Football Club, Dennis Gallimberti, you know, has resigned as, as, uh, as, as general manager because of the impending merger of, the, of, 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 of Footscray and Fitzroy. And my feeling is that it was, it was the headlines that night on radio and the headlines the next morning in the paper that probably triggered the VFL's mood. Probably I'm a bit Nick's side on this where I don't remember ever a deal being put up on a whiteboard or, or even typed anywhere that said A, B, C and D. I think we were still going through the process of what a, a model would look like and that would be right because uh, at that time, the Fitzroy Committee knew about it and, the, and certainly the Footscray Committee knew about it because they'd already put their hand up and they knew that Fitzroy were lurking. If they didn't know Fitzroy was lurking, 
I'd be very surprised. I think Gallimberti's ringing of the bell left the VFL with nowhere to move. I think that was my opinion. They were left with absolutely no other decision but to make it D-Day. I think that's pretty far-fetched. The stage is set for one of the most explosive meetings in the history of the game, with the Footscray board due to meet with the VFL Commission the following day. Has Dennis Gallimberti just blown the whistle on one of the most secretive deals in football history? Is the Fitzroy Footscray merger actually a done deal? Or has he just inadvertently trampled all over the VFL's plan to blindside the Bulldogs with an ultimatum? If so, his decision to go public may have actually painted his club into a corner it can't get out of. One thing is for certain, however, Tuesday, October 3, 1989, will turn out to be a date that the football world will never forget. And we'll take you right back into the centre of that storm as Footscray's fight for survival continues. That's when we return next time on Headliners. I had a young family at that stage and uh, just went home to my wife and kids to, to let them know what had occurred and sort of barricaded ourselves in because I knew that there would be, um, that all hell would break loose. There was nothing to hide. In theory, we were people sitting around the table with one objective and one desire. That was the best result for the Footscray Football Club and the survival of the Footscray Football Club. Now, the Footscray Football Club patently wasn't going to survive if the licence was lost. Headliners, the dogs are doomed. I said, we're gone. But Footscray has one more card to deal. If there had been a resolution passed at the Footscray Football Club surrender its licence, that would have been the end of the club that day. But that motion was never put. The VFL's barrister concedes the dogs have bought some time. His precise words were, we're going to give you just enough rope so you can hang yourselves. A Race Against Time, part two of Footscray's Fight for Survival. Next week, exclusive to Headliners. Good evening, Tiffany Cherry with the latest Fox stories in the history of football. Tuesday, October 3, 1989. The football world has awoken to the bombshell news that the Fitzroy and Footscray football clubs are about to merge and become the Fitzroy Bulldogs. Not since the ill-fated University Club departed the league in 1914 had the VFL lost a club. But the possibility of Footscray disappearing into oblivion appears to be a fait accompli. The full Footscray board is set to meet league officials at VFL House at midday and will be given a chilling high noon ultimatum. Merge or die. An unavoidable showdown is looming. In one corner, the almighty dollar. In the other, the almighty people. Part two of Footscray's fight for survival. Welcome to Headliners. It's made me more determined than ever to play next year. you're in. The Footscray Football Club is in serious financial trouble. Technically insolvent, its projected loss for 1989 is almost $800,000, following on from a 1988 loss of almost half a million. The club's accumulated debt is fast climbing towards $2 million, and with the Bulldogs' proposed rescue package being negotiated with the Footscray City Council, viewed by the VFL as nothing more than a short-term band-aid solution, the league has come to the conclusion that the doggies' time is up. VFL Chiefs have been unsuccessfully endeavouring to engineer a merger between two struggling Melbourne-based clubs for four years. The Bulldogs simply can't meet their financial obligations. Finally, the VFL has a merger scenario that can be actively pushed through. Footscray President Nick Collum has been empowered by his board to listen to merger offers and has attended a series of meetings with Fitzroy President Leon Wiegard and league officials where various possible merger scenarios have been tossed around. To this day, 
both Colum and WeGuard maintain that no formal proposal was ever presented or agreed to at these preliminary discussions held prior to the October 3 meeting at VFL House. But Footscray CEO Dennis Gallimberti has reason to believe otherwise and spent the previous night contacting media outlets all over Melbourne, revealing that a merger between Fitzroy and Footscray is about to be pushed through. Die-hard Bulldog fans are beside themselves at the unfathomable prospect that their beloved club is about to be voted out of existence. The proposed joint venture heavily skewed in Fitzroy's favour, appearing to be more of a takeover than a merger. I got a couple of late night phone calls after I got home then and got up and, uh, and did breakfast the next morning on the Fox and I just let fly. I was very emotional about it, um, very upset, um, angry, um, bitter, every emotion you could think of I had that morning and I just let the AFL have it. I just said it was wrong and it was, I took phone calls and did all that stuff. And then I got off here at nine o'clock and Tony Peake, the communications manager at the time, then uh, phoned me and said, what's your home address because I want to send this to you. And this is the, uh, the background of the Fitzroy Bulldogs and, uh, and all the things that were uh, involved in terms of how much debt there was and what was going to happen and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm amazed I've still got it because I should have thrown it on the fire. One of the great works of fiction. They can't do this to a club, you know, not to us. And um, I thought about it all night, you know, and then I just thought next morning, I woke mum and dad up early and I said, you know, the only way to beat them is get on the radio. The, you know, the media kills you or it can make you. So let's... Let's get support out there. And um, I got on, which was really fortunate, uh, 3AW said that I could go on at 8.30 and call for supporters to go down to the club and, and rally for support. Around about 11 o'clock, everyone was milling at the, uh, the ground. And there was probably around about six or 700 supporters there just crying and, um, and they're just like lost chooks. Someone said, um, let's all go to March on VFL House and all that sort of stuff, you know, and show our anger. And I said, hang on. I said, look, you've got the media right here now. You know, there's a, an opportunity for you to, to you know, the vent, the, the pain and that, and the grief. So I just started spruiking and said, this is social vandalism. The, the silver tails are coming to the dark of the night and absconded with our footy club. Meanwhile, the Footscray board are filing into VFL House. Are they, as the newspapers proclaim, dead men walking? Unbeknownst to Bulldog board members, the football media or the general public to this very day, the entire Fitzroy board has also been summoned to league headquarters. The Lions have agreed in principle to progressing merger discussions should the Footscray board unanimously support the venture. Ushered secretly into a side room, they're given strict instructions to remain out of sight. We hadn't visited all the points that would be of uh, interest to the Footscray people or the Fitzroy people. So I, I, that's why I'm tending to agree with, um, with Nick that we hadn't, we hadn't gone right down the track of formalising anything. We were determined not to do anything until the whole Footscray board had put their hand up and said, yes, we can't go on. Then that would have been the starting point for what you call the deal. We would have then started talking about the deal because we had them um, going out of business and Fitzroy offering them a partnership in an ongoing football club. So uh, whoever conjured up the, the two meetings happening at once must have known that they were very close. Well, I think that Ross Oakley had a mandate to uh, rationalise the competition and Ross Oakley was determined to reduce the number of Melbourne-based clubs and he saw Footscray as a soft target. The tension in the VFL boardroom is palpable as VFL Commission Chairman Ross Oakley commences his presentation. He laid it on the line. Gentlemen, this is where we're at. You have these problems, and he read out the problems that the club had that were mainly financial. We at the VFL have several options. The options include taking your licence away, and he was very specific about that. So this is what we're proposing for you. This is what we're putting on the table to you. Take it or leave it. There'd been some discussions between uh, the two boards and we brought the two boards together and we put the deal together. So we had to be the mediator. We had to bring them both closer together and, uh, and that's the role we played. Oakley strongly reinforces the fact that as directors of the club, the individuals around the table, along with other high profile supporters such as Charlie Sutton, who have provided individual guarantees, will be held personally liable for the Bulldogs' outstanding debts and may have their private assets seized to meet the repayments. The proposal sitting on the table in front of them 
clearly outlines two options and two options only, extinction or merger. If they refuse to sign the merger document, the club's licence will be revoked and an administrator appointed that very afternoon. One board member, Bob Moody, suffers a heart murmur and fears he's going to collapse as the pressure begins to take its toll. The commission left. Um, we sat around for quite some time, at least an hour, maybe two, discussing all of the options and what we should do. There was a lot of passion, a lot of people who didn't want the merge. I didn't want the merge. I would have done anything. What do we do, gentlemen? debate went round and round and round the table and finally it was put that we vote on whether we will accept to merge or not accept to merge. And before we did that I made it very plain that if it wasn't unanimous there would be no decision. But remembering that if we did that the threat was that we would have our licence revoked. We weren't in a position where we, we could consult anybody. We were, we were sitting around the table with a gun pointed at our head. No one would have liked to be in the position that Nick Collin was in um, in 1989, uh, prior to the fight back. I don't think that anyone who was in the position that he was in could have pulled any kind of rabbit out of the hat like the fight back was. One may uh, quibble with some of the decisions that he took, but you know, he'd been dealt a pretty bad hand at that point. I think at the end, the gun that was at our head, to our shame, to our shame, I think convinced us that we should accept what was being put to us. I don't think we had, we neither were given nor sought the opportunity. And I think we were wrong. We should have sought the opportunity, but I don't think we'd have been given it. That's the way it went. The board, the board voted for it. Um, eventually, I signed the document. Now, you know, it's interesting. Had the document not been signed, then the ensuing court proceedings couldn't have occurred. It was the fact that we were forced to sign a document in the fashion that we were forced to sign the document. By pushing us into that corner, holding the gun at our head, the VFL misread it and they shot themselves in the foot. Well, if the AFL and the AFL lawyers had done their job properly, we probably would have never had the opportunity to overturn the merger because if on that Tuesday at VFL House, where the Footscray board members met, if there had been a resolution passed that the Footscray Football Club surrender its licence, full stop, if that motion had have been carried, that would have been the end of the club that day. But that motion was never put. Um, so fortunately, um, that meant that the licence was still alive and had never been surrendered. The jubilant VFL commissioners now head next door to attend to the formality of receiving the Fitzroy Board's endorsement of the merger proposal. I hope that most of the people were a bit surprised at the um, elation of a couple of the um, directors. The press conference was going to be cancelled if nothing happened next door. And that's why they did the Irish jig when they came in and said everything's in place. Bang, announcement. Fitzroy agreed in principle. They, they were very like-minded um, to my original thought. They, 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 they had similar ideas to what I initially articulated to Ross, that yes, we'd be in it because that would be our future, pay all the debts off, $3 million in the bank, um, get the best of the two lists, you know, and it'd be just a wonderful football team. We didn't have a deal in place. So what we had was a concept in place that we all agreed with. And we had Footscray, who were out of business. So, and we were the only bidder to bring whatever was left of Footscray along with Fitzroy to make a merged team. Fitzroy's constitution dictates that the club will have to take the merger to its members for ratification. But given the Lions own perpetually parlous financial state, this is seen to be a mere formality. The media are called in for the historic announcement as an up and coming young Channel 10 journalist by the name of Eddie Maguire reports. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the VFL Commission and the boards of the Fitzroy and Footscray Football Clubs are very pleased to announce today the, the formation of a new force in VFL football called the Fitzroy Bulldogs. After three and a half hours of meetings today, the Fitzroy and Footscray Football Clubs are no more. Instead, the Fitzroy Bulldogs will play in the 13-team Australian Football League next year. It's a bit like um, 
if you were extremely ill and someone said you need a heart transplant, you don't really want it, but uh, you accept the heart because while it's not your heart beating in there, you're still alive. The first time in many, many years they're going to have a winning chance, I would think. And as far as the Footscray supporters are concerned, we're going to try and uh, have as much influence in the western suburbs as we can. The VFL told us today that it was the finish. The Fitzroy Bulldogs will play at Prince's Park, train at the Western Oval, select a combined team. The board of directors will consist of four from each club. Fitzroy President Leon Wiegard will be chairman. The chief executive will be Max Kelleher, the former Fitzroy chief executive. Their jumper will be the Fitzroy colours but with a new format. However, the insignia will be the Bulldog. More like a Fitzroy takeover than a merger. Under the agreement, the VFL will pay out the debts of both clubs, while the Fitzroy Bulldogs will be able to exceed their salary cap of $1.4 million. The VFL say Footscray would have been extinct because of an accumulated loss of $2 million. More than half of the players will go. There are 125 available, 58 to be selected, 67 to go into the internal draft. The 13-team competition means a bye will occur each week and paves the way for a South Australian team to enter the competition in 1991. After more than a century as the heartbeat of Melbourne's western suburbs, the Footscray Football Club is dead. But in rubber stamping the death notice, President Nick Collum has inadvertently signed the Bulldogs' stay of execution. A remarkable twist of fate that will not reveal itself until later in the week. The first stone has been cast in the greatest David and Goliath battle this game has ever seen. The seeds of Footscray's fight back have been sown and they're about to take root. The fight back begins. That's next on Headliners. There was never even a second thought because it was my club I was fighting for, so heck, you just go for it. Last week on The Gospel... You probably don't know Led Zeppelin is either. Who knows Coldplay? Casually dropped to us off air. I had a barbecue with someone you were bagging last week, Brownie. Who's that? Chris Martin. We're not even talking He's about Coldplay. <laughs> the Gospel, Friday on Fox Footy. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Superman Returns tumblers are now landing at Hungry Jack's. Purchase any value meal, and then for $2.50, you'll receive a Superman Returns collectible 3D tumbler. Collect all four, and leap into Hungry Jack's now. Sunday, live and exclusive from two, Fox Footy hosts an intriguing clash as Carlton battles the Western Bulldogs. The Blues have shown some promising signs this season. Straight through the centre for the young man. However, they face a Bulldog side that may be lacking height, but they sure don't lack any talent. He's got it! Take control. Press red to go Fox Footy active and put yourself in the director's chair. Your Sunday starts at two with the Blues and Bulldogs live and exclusive, followed by Cats Power, the winner's weekend wrap, then Magpies Dockers. Welcome back to Headliners. It's the afternoon of Tuesday, October 3, 1989, and VFL Chief Ross Oakley has just announced the merger of the Fitzroy and Footscray football clubs. Although to devastated Bulldog fans, it sounds far more like a takeover than it does a merger. Football fans of all denominations are stunned as the unthinkable suddenly becomes reality. Mergers have been a threat hanging over the competition for years, but no one can quite believe that one has finally materialised. Ken Oliver, son of Bulldog legend Arthur, storms into the Footscray Social Club and removes his father's portrait from the wall. Victorian Minister for Sport, former Geelong great Neil Trasize, urges the club to seriously consider returning to the VFA competition rather than disappearing off the face of the football earth altogether. If ever a football club needs those who love it, it's the Footscray Football Club right now. They had a gun put to their head, and I knew that if I was in that position, I might have reacted exactly the same. But, having said all that, this was the football club I loved, and that thousands of people loved, and they weren't going to take it away and, and merge it, and, and just make it disappear. Yeah, it was gutted, like we, we had no say in it at all. You wake up one morning, and there it is, we're gone. I mean, what do you do? It's like you lose your soul in a way, because that's what you live and breathe, your football, your football club. You go every weekend, you stand in the same spot. And it was just devastating for the people. That, to me, was the first 
real example I'd had of, of how football could fracture friendships. I mean, it, the emotion that, uh, that spilled over at the time was amazing. I've never seen a city react like it. Um, they realised that Footscray were being dudded here, dudded badly, by the league. No doubt in the wide world about it. The supporters have to, have to feel like they've got their say. Now, in this process, they really didn't have a say. They weren't given the opportunity to have a say. Because right up until that Tuesday, I stress, we were not talking merger seriously. We were talking merger investigation very seriously, but we were not talking merger. The apathy of the supporters, the lack of marketing, the lack of support by industry in the West, the lack of support commercially, financially, in any other way of the wealthy so-called supporters of Footscray, all that apathy together amounted to absolutely nothing for the Footscray Football Club. We used to go around cap and hand all the factories and there was thousands of them around there and they'd, you know, they may give you hundred dollars but they wouldn't do much. But to the ordinary supporter, the people who lived off Geelong Road and all those areas there, it was just the, uh, you know, their, their reason for living. The Footscray Football Club was at a very low ebb and it needed the jab up the arse to get it off its backside, to get it to stand up for itself. And it was, it was this whole merger thing. It backfired big time on the VFL. It was a huge backfire. There's a lot of people were pretty shuddered about the whole situation and uh, I mean not just the players but I think the, the ones that really were hurt the supporters who loved the club and been their life just some of those die hard passionate you know the ones that spirit you look in their eyes you see the red white and blue with their scarf and their beanies who just love the club and you can see you can just see that really hurting in them and that really even made us as players hurt even more and I remember as a group of players we met uh, that next week at the social club uh, one night it was, we obviously had a meeting at the club to discuss the merger and what our, our futures were going to be. Nearly every one of us had a beer in our hand, just saying, well, this is it. I knew what was in the hearts of the people of the western suburbs, and I knew they wouldn't let it go easily. So I was comforted by the fact that there would be an uprising and that there was a reform committee waiting in the wings to take over. Wednesday night at the Footscray Social Club which has become a home away from home for lost Bulldog fans refusing to accept their fate. Peter Gordon, the feisty local lawyer behind the previous year's Save the Dogs campaign, which had successfully lobbied the club to remain at the Western Oval, arrives at the club around 9.30, having been away on a court case since the bombshell first dropped. As soon as he came in the door of the social club, uh, the first thing we basically said to him was, well, what are we going to do? And um, he said, uh, the first thing he said is, we've got to go to court. So it wasn't as if we devised a strategy that night. Uh, On the basis of what he knew uh, as to what had transpired over the last two or three days, he basically said, without knowing any more and without looking at the legal position, he said, we've got to go to court. Have we got a plaintiff? Um, And the first plaintiff we thought we had was a woman called Carol Liddell. who was a member of the Bulldog connection. And uh, she was keen up to a point and then uh, was worried that if she lost the case, the the VFL would pursue her for costs and bankrupt her and throw her out of her home. And that was a legitimate concern. And sitting over by a table at the bar was Irene Chatfield. It's the first time I'd actually met Dennis Gallenberti. And uh, there was Stephen Palmer there and he said, um, what you're going to have to do is just meet us at Peter Gordon's in the morning, Slater and Gordon's in Footscray, and we'll just sign some papers and, you know, we'll protest against the, uh, them taking over, the VFL and uh, Fitzroy taking over. And I said, OK, that's fine. I didn't want to go to court, but we had to. You know, I mean, it's your club. And if you think you've got a chance to win, you go for it. For a merger to be enacted, uh, it needs the consent of 75% of the members. So that was the biggest loophole. The second loophole was that we believed that an administrator under corporations law had been appointed and the licence agreement at that point said that before an administrator is appointed or before an administrator can act, 
he's got to investigate and examine the affairs of the company for 28 days and, and then has to report to the members at the end of that 28 day period. So those two things hadn't happened. They didn't say, um, oh, you're going to lose your possessions and all that sort of stuff. But when we were sitting in court next day, I must have looked pretty nervy, I reckon. And the next minute, all these fellas are rushing over in their little suits and uh, they said, oh, you have to sign this, you know. And I said, what was it? And it was to say that if you lost, you'd be liable for it. And I said, does that mean what I got? And they go, yeah. I said, oh, well, what the hell? I've got the car, my life insurance, I've got everything I own. It doesn't worry to me, you know, I'll just do it again. So I just signed the paper. There was just, there was not even a second thought because it was my club I was fighting for. So, heck, you just go for it. The Victorian Supreme Court hears the case of Irene Chatfield versus the VFL. The league arguing that the Footscray Football Club has actually surrendered its licence, thereby eliminating requirements that members be consulted and the club given a month before action can be taken. But as Dennis Gallimberti quite rightly mentioned earlier, no such motion to formally surrender the licence was ever passed at the fateful Footscray board meeting on Tuesday morning. By day two of the case, Friday October the 6th, 1989, the VFL are forced to concede this critical point to Bulldog barrister Tim Ganain. The VFL's barrister had said to him, um, you made this application, God knows what you've got in mind, you know, you're in debt, you can't get out of it, but what we're going to do is we're going to give you time to raise these funds. His precise words were, we're going to give you just enough rope so you can hang yourselves. Um, so what we're going to do is just adjourn it for 21 days. The Footscray Football Club has just been brought back from the dead. A faint pulse revived in the form of a 19-day deadline to raise a whopping $1.5 million and keep it alive. It's widely regarded as a long shot at best. Peter Gordon and his unofficial rescue team have no staff, no money, and no plan. But they do have the most precious commodity any football club can lay claim to, hope. So when I was told that, it just clicked with me that the opportunity for a 21-day campaign with the threat of the noose hanging over us was a huge PR opportunity. And I recall saying to Tim on the phone, without even thinking about it, Tim, you just kicked the winning goal. Well, they thought they were giving us enough rope to hang ourselves because they thought that there was no way none would ever be able to raise enough money to clear the debt and that we'd, at the end of the 19 days we'd still be insolvent and therefore the court wouldn't entertain our application. But, um, of course, they uh, underestimated the resolve and the courage of um, the Footscray Football Club supporters and the wider football community. I came out of court there and I just knew we had the confidence. But confidence, hope and resolve don't pay the bills. I said, we've got no hope of doing that. I said, we're gone. There's no way known us as the Bulldogs or, or, or the footy club or our supporters in general can raise that sort of money. We've got no hope. I was cynical about it. I thought there'd be the almost knee-jerk reaction of people saying, we can't have this, and they'd wave the flags and make a lot of noise, and then it would all go away. It's time for the little man to stand up and be counted. Who really owns our game? The common man or the corporate machine? 19 days, $1.5 million, the clock is ticking. It's a daunting figure in the tough economic times of 1989, but if the Footscray Football Club is to survive into 1990, it will take the greatest community-based logistical performance in football history. The odds are, once again, heavily stacked against the battlers of the western suburbs. As English literary critic John Churton Collins once put it, in prosperity, our friends know us. In adversity, we know our friends. The inspirational conclusion to Footscray's fight for survival. When we return, next time on Headliners. I remember th thinking to myself and saying to Dennis, we've got 21 days and we need to use it. And, and what we're gonna, week one, we're gonna do this rally. Week two, we're gonna do this, call it, we're gonna have someone at every intersection in, in Victoria if we can. Uh, week three, we're going to do a concert. In the meantime, let's try and schedule whatever we can so we use the entire three weeks. And we knew that the work was in front of us. The Supreme Court of Victoria has just heard a legal challenge of the proposed merger between the Fitzroy and Footscray football clubs from a small group of determined Bulldog supporters. Forced to concede that the Dogs have not formally surrendered their licence, the VFL have given the club 19 days to raise $1.5 million, just enough rope to hang themselves. The odds are, once again, 
heavily stacked against the sons and daughters of the Scray. Their fate hinges on a football club harnessing the power of the people like never before. The remarkable conclusion to Footscray's fight for survival. Welcome to Headliners. It's made me more determined than ever to play next year. Carmen, you're in. There's Hudson in the hand. Nineteen days, one point five million dollars. There's no time for Peter Gordon, Dennis Gallimberti, and his small team of true believers to celebrate the slender lifeline they've been granted. If they are to defy the odds in these tough economic times, they need to quickly and effectively harness the latent passion for the Footscray Football Club that they believe to exist right throughout Melbourne's western suburbs. The key to galvanising the West will be a fight-back rally to be held at the Western Oval on Sunday morning, less than 48 hours away. The clock is ticking. We immediately went back to the offices of Slater and Gordon in Footscray and we set about forming a, a board in exile um, to administer the club, uh, outside the club if you like, to uh, organise and administer the campaign because at that point we weren't allowed to, um, we weren't al allowed access to the club or its records. I felt that the, the key component to it was to project on the, on the Sunday morning, not just a sense of outrage but a sense of we reject all that and we are going on and we've got a plan and here are the elements to it and all it needs is you. And I thought the elements of that plan were firstly to have a board, secondly to have a coach and to be honest with you I didn't really care who it was. <laughs> I just wanted to be able to announce we had a coach um, that morning. The preference was Terry Wheeler because um, he had, um, he'd been reserves coach and he was a Footscray boy and you know, much loved by the um, by the faithful and knew the players, you know, I think I said to him, um, here's what we're doing um, and we're going to raise this money and we think if we do that we'll have a team for next year and we'd like you to coach the, coach the club. The third element of Peter Gordon's master plan is the players, who are as confused and concerned about their immediate futures as anyone. The Fitzroy Bulldogs will sign a total of 58 players from the combined Fitzroy and Footscray lists, with the 67 leftovers to end up at the Brisbane Bears or take their chances in the national draft. I do recall very clearly going to meet with EJ and Charlie. Uh, it was in the uh, old um, past players room and there was a big poster of EJ and Charlie with the 54 flag behind them as they were speaking to us. And I look, kept looking at it and it really hit home that the fact that hey, we were gone. We were certainly gone. We were, it was all over. Bulldogs were gone. No more. And that would have been the tough thing, losing those guys who were your mates to go and play wherever they have to play. The VFL turned some of the players against us. It was crucial, we thought, to have a list of players at the rally on Sunday the 8th of October. And we mustered a good 25 to 30 players that day. But the VFL got to certain players not to go. We were told to keep, uh, keep a low profile, um, not to get too heavily involved in the whole razzmatazz of the uh, Save the Bulldogs type of thing. They got their media unit to start conditioning the press to put out stories that our campaign was hopeless. So they did their best to dampen any hope we had to get a large number of people to that rally at the Western Oval. Front page of the Sunday Age is a letter to me <laughs> from Ross Oakley saying, uh, bear in mind, you don't have to just raise uh, $1.5 million, you've got to raise $5 million. And unless you can guarantee us you can do that and show us a three-year cash flow, that, um, uh, then you're in trouble. Sunday, October 8, 1989. D-Day for the Footscray Fightback campaign with a revival rally scheduled for 10am at the Western Oval. A big turnout will spread belief and hope throughout the Western suburbs. But a small showing will effectively end the resistance once and for all. As I was driving to the ground, there were media reports in, in, on various media outlets that there was nobody at the ground, that the, uh, the campaign was hopeless, there was no point going there because it couldn't possibly achieve anything. And I remember being over there and, uh, and there was Peter Gordon, there was Dennis Gallimberti and there was Alan Dalton who wrote the book Too Tough to Die. And there was around about 50 people there who thought, oh, well, we've lost it. The day was grey, the morning was grey. I got there about 10 to 10. Set up in the stand, there was about two or three hundred people. I thought, oh my God, we're gone. And then all of a sudden, people come from everywhere. I think they sort of just realise, you know, that um, if they don't make it to the club, they don't donate, we're gone. Today was the day they were going to stand up and be counted. Even at about 10 o'clock, it didn't look like that big a crowd, you know. Um, but 
um, as it got going, I remember thinking to myself like a minute in, into the speech, where are those people come from? And it was, just, it was big. There have been various estimates as to how big it was, but boy, oh boy, it was big. And I'd announced, please welcome onto the Western Oval the Footscray Football Club team for 1990. And as they started walking out of the race, the wall of sound that came from those people who had just packed one half of the Western Oval was just extraordinary. Despite suggestions to the contrary from the powers that be, 25 senior Footscray players march out to show their support. Peter Gordon whips the crowd into a frenzy with an intentionally provocative statement. This may be the last time you see a Footscray team assembled on the Western Oval. It's up to you. It was like a hero welcome. You, know, you walked in, they were cheering you. And, um, it really was emotional, it really was emotional. It just really, once again, it hit home how much that the, not just the Footscray Footy Club, Western Suburbs, people wanted their footy club. They were so passionate about keeping their own club. And uh, geez, that, was, that was a very emotional, um, emotional time it was, yeah. It was like a physical thing. It was just an amazing volume and, and power of emotion. It was an extraordinary thing. Went on for minutes. His background was perfect. He was a Western Suburban boy. He loved the footy club. Uh, he's the, 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 the battling boy made good. All those things, all the ingredients were just so typified, so typified the Bulldogs and that Bulldog spirit and he milked it for whatever. And when I say milked it, I don't mean in a nasty way, but he, he tapped into it. He knew the nerves to touch and he, and he got to immobilise the, uh, the doggies and probably a large part of the footy community and said, we're not going away. Think of how you'll feel um, when you wake up the first round next year and every, all of your mates' teams are playing that day, but yours isn't and will never do so again. Think of how you'll feel about that. You know, there's the players over there, if you want them to be out here in six months' time, then you've got to give and you've got to give and you've got to keep on giving. It was like a big wave of emotion just washed over you as you got up there and talked, and everybody just rallied and the money that was flying around the joint at that stage. I'd never seen money like that at Footscray. <laughs> Nobody had. I have kids and I, and I wanted my kids to, to barrack for this football club. Um, and that the footy club had meant a lot to me for a number of years. Um, I, have, I have lifelong friends that I know at that club, and for, to, to, for me to, to see the Peter Fosters and Doug Hawkins of the world uh, and they weren't going to play for that footy club. And they were balling. In fact, we're all balling. It turned out to be speech after speech after speech and the sun came out and everything just, you know, it was like the wind changing direction in the last quarter. Everything kind of um, turned our way and people gave great speeches. The most um, inspirational speaker was Peter Gordon because uh, he laid out the plan and he laid out the reasons why we should stand up and fight for the club. He explained that you know, it'd be easy for us to lay down and let the club go, but it needed a lot of courage and a lot of fight to turn the situation around and that this was the time when we all had to stand up and fight. I remember that day, as I said, arriving at the ground with, with absolutely no hope and walking into the ground and suddenly there was hope. I wore my life members badge and uh, uh, as I spoke I, I just looked at it and I touched it and I said uh, I always wanted to be a life member of, of, of Footscray and I said and I don't want to be a life member of nothing. Um, yeah, very special times. We all know how fierce the rivalry is on match day between, certainly between the, the, uh, the 12 Victorian clubs but when you attack one of them, it was like, it always reminded me of the big Irish family. It's okay to fight amongst yourselves when you're Irish, but if anyone comes from the outside and tries to change the dynamics, then the whole 12 unite and they turn on the, uh, the intruder. I think the issue became bigger than Footscray, it became a football issue, and people from other clubs realised, well, this is going to happen to our club. The Richmond cheer squad were there in, in droves on, on that particular day. They, they did a terrific effort. You know, they raised a lot of money for us. Um, I think St Kilda was there too. There were a number of the supporter groups and, and the cheer squads that, that, that got involved. When I saw the number of people who were there and the level of anger amongst the crowd, I knew from that point, and we hadn't raised a cent yet, I knew from that point onwards that the campaign was successful. People turned up expecting to voice a bit of rage and despair that their football team had gone, and they left thinking, we can, we can and we have turned this around. I was surprised at the level of money we raised that day. Look, there were a lot of emotional scenes, and you know, there, were, there were growing people crying, 
And, um, but there were a lot of people who had a, a very fierce resolve and a look in their eye that you could tell that they weren't prepared to allow the VFL um, to, um, to, run, to run over the top of them. I've always been proud, but it, yeah, I, I think that day uh, I've never been prouder of the members and, and, and maybe I've never been as in touch with the members as I was on that day. You don't appreciate what supporters do, what supporters feel, and what supporters go through for their club. You know, it was an incredible awakening, and yeah, I was enormously proud of them that day. The rally was really a watershed. I mean, I think people tended to forget about Fitzroy after after the rally and focus on um, what, what we could achieve. It was a real privilege to be part of it, and I doubt that I or any of the people who uh, were there or played a significant role in it will ever see the like of it again. More than 10,000 people have voted with their feet and hearts. The Footscray fightback is well and truly alive. The Footscray Football Club has gone from being dead and buried to raising almost a third of their financial target, an incredible $450,000 in one unforgettable day at the Western Oval. There's still plenty of life in the old dogs yet, but with more than a million dollars still to be found, it will take a mass community effort from the entire Western suburbs the likes of which have never been seen. The fight back continues. That's next on Headliners. We didn't have anywhere to put it and we ended up putting it in a, um, in a police cell. <laughs> and um, we had to go to the police and ask them for the use of the police cell. And from memory, they didn't have a key to the cell or they, um, they couldn't secure it. And uh, the money was left overnight in a cell which was basically with the door ajar. Last week on the Gospel. Now the box shorts, they say, it's gonna be skin color. Be skin color. What would Brad Hardy wear? <laughs> <laughs> Flaming red one. <laughs> That's the Gospel on Fox Footy Channel. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Superman returns tumblers are now landing at Hungry Jack's. Purchase any value meal, and then for $2.50, you'll receive a Superman Returns collectible 3D tumbler. Collect all four and leap into Hungry Jack's now. It's 1970 Blues versus Pies. Alex Jezelenko. Alex Jezelenko! Jezelenko! Oh. Yeah. Okay. Jezzy, you stand here. I'll be Mackay. Dave, you can be uh, Jerker Jenkins. <laughs> Little bit of leverage for Jezelenko! You'll be all day. Takes it to the wing position. Oh, Jezelenko! Oh. Oh. You'll be all day! Yeah! Oi. Yes! Oh. A nice grab. <laughs> And Reese Shaw, awkward half volley, brilliant! A brilliant goal! One touch opening. A vibrant screen. 1.3 megapixel camera. Bluetooth connectivity. And a music player that fit your lifestyle as perfectly as it fits your hand. The new Nokia 6131. Fits you. Nokia. Connecting people. New in Harley Norman's Games Hotspot. Are you ready to play? The huge first-person shooter game is coming to PC and Xbox 360. An amazing game that turns your world upside down, literally. Walk on walls and ceilings, run through portals, and even leave your body behind in the all-consuming pursuit of revenge. It's time to play. Only on PC and Xbox 360. Now at Harvey Norman's Games Hotspot. Winners. Fair gets the kick away. Losers. That's about as bad as it gets. And everything in between. Oh, what a beauty. Oh. He's getting out. The winners. 7.30 Sunday night on Fox Footy Channel. Welcome back to Headliners. It's October 1989 and the Footscray Football Club is fighting for its life. 
With $50,000 in coterie pledges, along with $400,000 cash carted across the road in a wheelie bin from Slater and Gordon to be deposited in the Commonwealth Bank, the first blow in the Footscray fight back has been a telling one. Peter Gordon and his board in exile now turn to a mass community fundraising drive hitting the streets of Melbourne in pursuit of a further $1 million. There were just people coming from everywhere doing in incredible things. You know, Seth Sargent, who was you know, running the, the entire Bulldog merchandising operation from his second-hand ute. The drill hall out at Footscray, near the ground, became a, a sort of a hive of activity where every Footscray barracker came in and gave something. And there were, there were collectors everywhere. It's like Children's Hospital Appeal. It was just that big. They were collecting everywhere. There were people who really had uh, not remotely the physical capacity to do it, walking the streets, knocking on doors day after day after day. There were people answering the door who were in very straitened financial circumstances themselves, unemployed people, pensioners, disabled people, giving away far more money than they responsibly should have. But there was no other way the club was going to be saved. It was not going to be saved out of the uh, pockets of government or big corporations. It was going to be saved by the ordinary people who lived in the, in the western suburbs, and so that kind of pain was was necessary. It took me two years to catch up on my Medibank, you know, because we put money in, but you just put in. It didn't matter how far you were behind on other accounts, who cares, as long as your club was going to be there. To be able to organise a campaign of that size in such a short time, it's just incredible. And how they did it, I still don't know, but the volunteers came forward, um, they door knocked, they went on every street intersection, they come back day after day. It was just an amazing community effort. Kids were opening their, their cans on the corners and opening their, their piggy box to give their couple of dollars, you know, to keep the Bulldogs alive. It really was an amazing effort by, not just the Western Suburbs, I think football people in general. They just got behind us. Melbourne's West is awash with emotion, and there are simply too many stories to share all of them with you here. The Fight Back book, Too Tough to Die, shares remarkable tales such as the old digger in his late 80s, who canvasses support from every shop along Williamstown and Somerville Roads, limping along slowly and painfully on his walking stick. The touching story of a man in his 90s, no longer able to speak because of a stroke suffered years earlier. When shown newspaper clippings screaming death of the bulldogs, tears slide silently down his cheeks. His son says it's the first time he's ever seen his father cry. A couple of volunteers knock on the door of a West Footscray flat. The door opened by a man and woman in the process of packing possessions. Their mother has just died. The collectors apologise and begin to leave, only to have $100 slipped into their tin. Mum loved the Bulldogs and we know she would have wanted this. A European-born woman has lived in the western suburbs since arriving in Australia as a World War II refugee. Sharing in the remarkable camaraderie of the Drill Hall gang, she tells her newfound friends that it's the first time in more than 40 years that she truly feels like she belongs. Likewise, the West's previously disenfranchised Vietnamese community, who know little if anything about VFL football, but recognise the significance of saving their club. It was a mass movement of people who were willing to put aside you know, individual differences, individual financial trouble, time, and just, and just pitch in. And it would not have happened. It absolutely would not have happened um, unless very large numbers of people were prepared to do extraordinary things, which they did over a three or four week period. Well, they just sang that song over and over and over again. And uh, the tins just kept jingling along. That's, that's football in the raw and that's what it's all about. There were people in that drill hall who, um, who were there 16, 17 hours a day. They had all become good friends and good mates and, and a lot of the, the bonds and the friendships that were formed then persist uh, to this day. Likewise, you know, the board that formed um, uh, at that time, you know, with people like, like Mike Fian and, and Adrian Fitzpatrick and Peter Welsh and, and myself, essentially stayed together for the, for the next seven years. Every conceivable means of raising funds is called upon. The drill hall becomes the epicentre of a network of raffles, jumble sales, trash and treasure markets, lamington drives, and of course, the tin rattling campaign. 500 tins had gone out initially, with early estimates hoping for a $50,000 return. But as volunteers begin returning with full tins, only to get them empty before heading out again, organisers begin to appreciate 
that they are onto something far more special. A woman with two artificial legs hobbles into the drill hall on crutches, insisting she takes part in the efforts. Off she heads with a collection tin strung around her neck, returning hours later with it filled to the brim. Sure enough, she empties it, hobbles back out the door and returns a few hours later with another full tin. Day one of the door knock raises $110,000, with a further $80,000 collected on day two. With tins still trickling in throughout the days to follow, the Fight Bank bank account has swollen to $800,000. With a Legends game at Skinner Reserve between former Footscray and Collingwood greats set to raise a further $75,000, the positive momentum of the Fight Back campaign is near irresistible. And all of a sudden it became this, this whole new animal with its own energy and it became politically right to be involved. It was a, a socio-political change in the stance of the club. And it was terrific, because people all of a sudden were motivated and people were passionate. We had a positive brand, as the, as the marketers say, and people wanted to be associated with us and there were offerings of support coming from people that had never contacted us before. We were struggling to sort of, you know, with sponsors and all of a sudden people are putting in 50,000 and all this and like, we would have killed for that 12 months, we get, you know, before that, but that's, that's the whole thing that was sort of frustrating in, in some degree that we, you know, all of a sudden when the club was gone, the people wanted to put in. There was a lot of uh, corporate support, there was a lot of corporations in the western suburbs who had um, employees working for them uh, who basically their aspiration and their hopes and their happiness or well, their level of happiness rose and fall on the back of how the football club was doing. Peter Gordon and his team have successfully tapped into that classic us against them western suburbs mindset. The target of this driving animosity is a man who symbolises the enemy, VFL chief Ross Oakley. It had to be an us versus them, it had to be, uh, it had to be those guys in their ivory tower versus us working class people. That was the only way they were going to really bring their support base together. I, uh, and they did a great job. It was a high stakes game and it was being played at a PR level. I'm relieved and I'm pleased and I'm proud that we never did things like print his address because, you know, there were some rather extreme elements in my camp that had it and wanted to. I think um, the Up Yours Oakley one, or Merge Oakley and Oakley, one of them was the creation of uh, Peter Gordon's wife. Uh, and it just took off. In fact, so much so that uh, Ross Oakley's son, Greg, actually had one of the stickers on his the back of his uh, the back of his car. Ross is, a, is an intriguing bloke. I mean, he has got a great resilience and a great capacity to live with uh, with the trauma that was going on around him. I had guards on my home for 12 weeks. Uh, the guards removed someone from the property late at night, 12 o'clock at night. Uh, our kids had to be escorted to school. Um, so he was that was tough going for a period of time and. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, one should have to put up with that sort of uh, behaviour, but that's the passion of the game. And, you know, I take a lot of the credit for saving the Footscray Footy Club because they raised most of that from selling up yours Oakley car bumper stickers. With victory in sight, all that remains is to secure some all-important corporate support. With unions threatening to black ban all VFL projects if Footscray disappears, the Victorian government announces that the Road Traffic Authority's $162,000 Bulldog sponsorship will continue if the doggies survive. The icing on the fight back cake is the procurement of ICI as the club's new major sponsor. ICI, uh, I think, were the first company that sponsored, not because they wanted Footscray supporters to buy their products, but because they wanted to get some uh, recognition uh, that they were a member of the community and a, a good community citizen. The ICI deal is announced on Monday, October 24, the same day that the new Footscray board unveils their interim plans for 1990 at VFL House. The Bulldogs have $1.15 million in their fightback account, as well as new sponsors and a new business plan to carry them forward into the new decade. The war is over. The Footscray Football Club and those who love it have defied the odds and one. Well, I'd like to know that we're debt free. Um, we've got a strong trading position for next year. We've got a good team with the best young players in the league and uh, look out for Footscray in the 1990s. 
it's very hard to describe a moment like that. It's, it's the, the word that, that comes to mind is a sense of anti-climax. You know, I was 32 years old. I'd been a partner at Slater and Gordon literally for 10 days. I'd never run a business. You know, frankly had very little idea of what was in front of me. So, um, you, know, I had a, a, you know, it was all mixed with a sense of trepidation and uncertainty. I don't remember if it was Dennis or, or Peter who phoned me and said, we've got it, we've done it. And it was just one of those things we just sat there in shock. We can probably equate it to a, a premiership victory in a way. I, I mean, I've never seen one. And in some ways that merger victory was a, a victory for the people and for the club. It was such a proud moment that day to see all those people there. But when they said we've made it, oh, that, that was absolutely unbelievable because, you know, you knew then your club's there. Get emotional. <laughs> And that's what this fight back campaign truly represents. While winning and losing will always be important, the true supporter's love of his or her football club is more about belonging. Footscray's remarkable victory is viewed by many as a turning point in the history of our game, a significant crossroads for the masses. Told to roll over and accept financial reality, they've chosen to stand up and fight to keep their dream alive. The league may well run football, but the people own it. While the Bulldogs have earned their stay of execution in 1989, they're far from out of the woods. There'll be plenty more battles to come. Dreams don't come cheap, and they certainly don't come easy. But here's to dreaming a little longer. Thanks for your company for this edition of Headliners. Join us again next time we flick through the pages of football history, right here on Fox Footy. Sometimes the little guy does get up and, and you know, David does beat Goliath. Doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does. It's too tough to die. That's what they were, too tough to die. For all of the, the battle, for all of the struggles, for all of the difficulties and the lack of money and the lack of infrastructure and the bad luck, it survived. And that's the soul of its great football club. So from my own personal point of view, I think I probably thought that, well, when do I go back home to Darwin? Because <laughs> I would have thought that if the teams had emerged, it may have been a bit of a, a stretch for a round eight draft pick to, to sort of go to a merged team. And mm. um, in, uh, in the sort of days preceding that, the club just said, look, just hold tight and we'll see what happens. It's a pretty good round eight draft pick, Wolsey. Oh, my word. 105, weren't you? <laughs> it was a long way back. Yeah. yeah. A long way back. Chris, uh, that little bit of vision, we saw you wearing number 29. When did you move to number three? It was 94, end of nine, so it would have been at the end of 93 season. So 94 was my first year of wearing number three and uh, Gary O'Sullivan, the football manager at the time, uh, at the start of pre-season said, look, um, it's been vacant for 12 months and we're thinking about you taking it on, what do you think? And it took me about three seconds to decide. Mm. <laughs> so I jumped at the chance, yeah. Chris, it seems that, uh, I mean, one of the biggest sporting <clears throat> topics I think we've had in the last decade has been your neck. It went on on Talkback Radio for the best part of three months through an <laughs> off-season and yet it just seems a long time ago. Can you take us through what happened because it was as if you were on your football deathbed there for a long time? Well, I don't think it stopped. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm uh, a liability still if you sort of still talk to people in, the, in footy. Um, I mean, pretty much what happened was that I sustained what was a stinger to the arm yep. and I had all that checked out. Uh, at the end of the year, because I had two of them during that season. At the end of the year, I went to a, a um, neurosurgeon just to make sure everything was fine. In fact, I had three reports done just to clarify that everything was okay. And that and all a sting came... to the neck, what caused by a stretch well, sting, of the sting it to the arm. Um, so it is a little bit different, and that's where the confusion came in, because a sting to the neck is obviously spinal cord. Yep. A sting to the arm is a nerve that runs off the spinal cord and actually mm -hmm. feeds your limb. So that's where I think the confusion actually started. Um, you'd have to sort of delve into behind the scenes and be a fly on the wall in AFL House because pretty much what happened was that everything had been clarified and been put to bed and um, I went to start pre-season training and they said, no, actually you can't. The insurance company that insures us all um, is refusing to insure you. Yeah. So we need to 
extend the, um, the research in it and see where you're at. And I was like, well, it's already been done. Mm. So it just went on and on and on. And it was a little bit of argy-bargy there between myself, my management and the club and um, the AFL. And the club were in total support of me, but it took about 12 weeks. Mm. It was not until pretty much post Christmas that we got it sorted out. I remember uh, there's very few occasions where I've seen this man unhappy, but uh, I happened to write a story about your neck condition. Do you remember that on the mm. front page of the uh, Herald mm. Sun? Remember, you, you were, remember it? You were less than pleased, weren't you? I think you thought, did you think it was an invasion of your privacy well, because we're talking about a medical condition? I think that um, I think that the real critical thing about it was that they needed to ask one question and one simple question, and you could have asked the same, like, and Sorry. that was that the spinal cord. It wasn't a spinal cord, spinal cord injury; it was a nerve injury, and. And pretty much once that information was actually relayed to the insurance company and the AFL were settled with that, I had to go to two other uh, specialists um, in Melbourne, in uh, Roy Carey and Peter Wilde, and, uh, and they categorically put it to rest that it was not a spinal cord injury at all. And that's where the confusion mm. came about, that the AFL and the insurance company were concerned that it was a spinal cord injury, and that's where the misreporting came in and it became a bit of a farce in the end, really. Chris, uh, 17 years, 330 games, just a marvellous record and effort, and you're still playing at both ends of the ground. Uh, you'll swing from one end to the other. Your very best years, where, what position did you play? Uh, probably my best years is, I mean, any footballer's best years are probably from 24 to 28. Um, and in those years, I was sent half forward, and in 96, I played pretty much the whole year at sent half back. Um, but probably my best football. <coughs> I've played would be at centre forward, and that would be from about '97 to say 2000. I'd say you've played under two of the most progressive coaches in AFL, in Terry Wallace and Rodney Eid. What are the differences? Oh, a lot different. Um, I mean, Terry Terry brought a lot of new things into the to the game that weren't probably <coughs> ever thought about at that time. Um, you know, immediate post game and uh, <laughs> before the game had finished uh, interviews. Um, he was very open to the media having access to the inner sanctum of a football club. And I think up until then, that was a bit of a no-no. Mm. Um, Rodney's taught me, I mean, he's only been my coach now for 18 months, and um, tactically, he's just absolutely outstanding. Um, I've learnt more in the last 18 months than I've probably learnt in my whole football career. Um, so different in a lot of ways, different in a lot of ways. Did you need to be talked into playing this year? Oh, I would have six w weeks before the end of the year last year. Um, I had a broken jaw last mm. year, broken cheekbone, um, broken rib at the start of the year, and then I had a six-week period where I tore my medial ligament and I was out for, for those games. The last two games before I came back, we'd been pretty much belted off the park by Fremantle in Perth, and then the following week, Adelaide and Adelaide, where we kicked five goals, five, I think. Mm. And I probably just thought that, OK, well, look, I can understand where Rocket might actually want to head. Um, an old player on the list, so you want to sort of rejig things to, um, you know, build and build and build for the future, and I may not be part of that. And I was, I was very open to all of that and, and quite sort of settled on where I sort of sat within the list. But the last six games of the year were, I mean, we jumped out of, mm. <laughs> jumped out of the grass almost. Yeah. We just came from nowhere. And, um, and once those six games had been played, I thought, gee, if I could just get one more year out of myself and be part of some exciting footy, which I'm really glad I have, I'm really glad I continued this year to be part of that. It's been a great year. Are you thinking the same thing now, if I can just get one more year out <laughs> of myself? Oh, look, we're, you know, it's, it's going to be um, a difficult year to, to win the Premiership from where we are. But in saying that, I mean, once you're there, um, teams have, have gone far once they've just been part of the finals action. So we're not riding off the year. No, no, I understand that. But I'm talking about, from Next your year. point of view, 2007, when, when Luke Darcy, Robert Murphy, Mitch Hahn, all those folks come back. Very enticing. It's very yeah. enticing to continue. Because I know with our best 22 out there that we've stretched a lot of teams. We're just having a look at you from uh, some of Eskie's <clears> finest work, the ISO here of Chris Grant. Looking at this, Chris, I mean, you're just a pup. <laughs> you're getting at least another 12 months in you. <laughs> yeah, you've played every game this year, Chris. You, uh, yeah. Early on, you got a couple of really hard hits in the back. I remember that. But you've got up each week. Yeah, look, I have. And... Um, I mean, the knocks to the back in the start of the year certainly didn't help my course too much. And when they occurred, there were still 20-odd games of footy to go. Mm. But, you know, once I 
got through that and you know sort of got the bruising away I have actually felt quite good so um, it is enticing to continue it's it's you know the carrot's still there there's no doubt about that because in my career the one thing that's really missing is is playing in a grand final so it's why I played this year and that's I guess the most enticing thing about playing next year. What's the highlight then of your career? Yeah, obviously you want to play in a grand final, a premiership. Over the 17 years, what's been the highlight? Um, to play the amount of games I think at one club. I, I'm really proud of that. Um, a lot was made about me having the opportunity of going to Port. And I really do look back on that now and, and, and really treasure the fact that I stayed. Was um, it close? It was close for a, a, probably about a two week period um, where the club was still fairly much um, hanging in the balance off field for about two weeks. Um, the future wasn't look, look, looking good at all and then David Smorgan and Rick Kennedy and those boys sort of came in and I sort of felt that if those guys could actually sort of get a bit of control off the field with corporate sponsorship and, uh, and the right people in the right places that we might actually have a chance of improving and luckily enough we did. It's an outstanding CV, we all acknowledge that, but it may well have had a Brownlow attached to it. Does that haunt you? Does it eat away at you or is it just something that happened and you've moved past it? Oh, I've moved well past it. I mean, look, I couldn't say that I look back and have fond memories about it. Mm. It wasn't a great situation to be in. Um, and probably more the, the fact of how it all sort of came about and why I was sort of put in those, that position, um, the three umpires on the day. You know, even on the Monday, didn't want to report me for it. They saw fit that it was a free kick and they paid that and the game went on. Um, Holland was fine. Um, so it was more, more to do with sort of how it came about that probably I look back on. That the AFL, in fact, yeah, intervened. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. If you, if you crossed paths with Ian Collins, would you be cordial? Uh, yeah, I'd probably say that. I don't think um, he, in the, in the last sort of 10 years, it's always been 10 years since it occurred, um, has sort of uh, stepped back and and had the opportunity of sort of saying, oh, I could have maybe done things differently. Um, we hadn't done it ever in the past pre mm. that, and I'm pretty much the only one that's ever happened to, so. Yeah, now I want to ask you, in your own view, you've seen it obviously <coughs> several times since, do you believe that it warranted a suspension? No, no, I mean, look, that's what we were pushing at the time. Um, even now, it's vivid within my memory that I was clearly, in my mind, going for the footy. Um, there's no doubt that I connected with Nick's head. Yeah. How long um, were you suspended for? Just a week. Just a just week. Just enough. A week. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I guess in this day and age, um, with a good record, and it was the first time I'd ever been reporting my career that it might be a bit different. Mm. That looked like an open hand to you, Jerry. It did. Yeah. Was it, Chris? Yeah. An open hand. Yeah. Yeah. So in, uh, under the new system, Wolsey, you don't actually get Under the new system, <laughs> he'd get three weeks yeah. and then they'd knock a few points off to two weeks because he's a good bloke, they'd bring it back to one and then they'd say, look, you can play. <laughs> Probably, Robert. If only, that's how it works. Now, Chris, have you ever lost your cool on the football field? Uh, yeah, I probably have. I probably have. And the times I probably have, it's probably to do with myself, to tell you the mm. truth. I don't lose my cool. But your demeanour is impeccable, isn't it, isn't it, Wolsey? I mean, it's just oh, yeah. over such yeah. a long period. Uh, uh, absolute professional. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't tend to go off my tree at any stage, and if it is, it's, it tends to be if I've done something myself wrong. Chris, what's it mean to you to break <coughs> two legends' record? I mean, it's sat with Ted Whitten, who's one of the biggest names the game's ever had, probably in the top two or three. Uh, Doug Hawkins, similarly, just a, a legend of the game, and now Chris Grant. Uh, it's, a, it's a mighty mantle for you. Yeah, it is something. Look, I'm really proud of it because of the fact that I've been with the club for, for 17 years now. I mean, Doug and EJ are our almost two biggest names, probably yeah. along with Charlie Sutton. Um, having had the opportunity of wearing EJ's number for so many years has been an absolute privilege. Um, and Doug's still today the best yeah. player I've ever, ever seen whilst I've been playing with. Um, so to be up there sort of with them, is, it's great. EJ won't be surpassed by any stretch of the imagination, mm. and neither will Doug for that matter. But, um, but I'm, I'm proud, of the op proud to have the opportunity of actually succeeding and getting to the games that I have, because it's been a battle probably the last three years. So you say Hawk, the best player you've played with, or the best player that you've seen play while you've been no, playing? No, probably the best I've seen play would be Ablett, um, Dunstall and, and, uh, and Hurd. They're, they're the three. Um, but to play with, mm -hmm. I still regard Hawk, which I still say is an incredible effort because when I started playing with Dougie, he was already 30. Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. I would love to have played with him when he was on the wing and you know flying when he was 25. What do you do, Chris, when your career's over? 
Uh, I've got a, a development sort of building company that I've been wanting to sort of really get into post footy. I've been doing it whilst I've been playing, but the last 18 months has been a bit of a battle just to get out of the park. So that's been put to the side and I'll be getting into the building game uh, post, post footy. He's just going to buy the other half of Williamstown. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, uh, great to have you in. Uh, I know EJ would have been proud that you've worn his number with great distinction and uh, I think we've all just been thrilled to watch you develop and uh, enjoy a, a long career. Have a great weekend. Uh, it's going to be a memorable one for you. Yeah, thanks, boys. Thanks Congratulations. Good, Good on you, Chris. Man. Thanks, boys. Chris Grant, uh, our special guest, and that uh, is the best way to sum him up. A special player and a big weekend for the Bulldogs coming up. Uh, we'll take a break. More after this on On the Couch. and uh, if he plays well week one week I might not play that well and vice versa so we uh, yeah we work well together. And Mark obviously I mean it's great for you guys to get a win is the overwhelming feeling just a relief one because of those distracting issues um, in the lead up and also just for, for Danny Frawley? Yeah when you win when you lose eight in a row it, uh, you know you really start to wonder whether you can actually win one and um, we, everything just went right tonight you know goals we're going through from you know freakish snaps and um, you know when it's your night it's your night and it, it just was our night tonight and not the mine support, but the, the team's not. Does the supporters give you a good sort of cheer as you come off? I'm sorry? The supporters were they good on the way off? Yeah they were fantastic tonight it was good. <laughs> Beautiful work Mark well, you've been one of the shining lights at the Richmond Football Club it's delightful to watch you play and I'm sure we'll get many years of enjoyment out of watching you play and so please say good day to Richo from all of us uh, at after the game. Mark Coggle and everybody with Jeremy <laughs> Sam, it was a distracting yeah. week for the Richmond Football Club. They had their memo oh. that was leaked, that was sent around by their communications manager. Well, it was written by their communications mm. manager, Paul Maley, former NBL player, actually. But um, he was obviously asked to do it. I mean, he shouldn't be chastised for writing no. the document. Yeah, he thought he was just sending around a photocopy <laughs> of his ass. Right. Yeah. <laughs> just and got it, out of control. <laughs> incredibly. I mean, we'll just remind people that it, it did um, contain some pretty sensitive information about the image of Danny Frawley and um, Paul Maley's assessment of what um, supporters think of him and what he needs to do to get them on board. Well, apparently Danny's had to cut back his media <laughs> commitments and now he actually won't be appearing on Australian Idol, which is uh, <laughs> uh, surprising. Not at all. surprising. Do you mean, but the, the memo was never intended for Danny Frawley's eyes, which I think is the most embarrassing yeah, thing. Yeah, it's Oh, yeah. Where did you get it? Oh, well, I don't want to divulge my sources, but we found some really <laughs> interesting stuff in it. Things like, um, oh, uh, look to recruit players with limited potential so as not to disappoint the fans. <laughs> um, yeah. I've got, I got one staff should not laugh at Richo. Oh. Just to, yeah, around, around the corridors at Punt Road. Yeah. That's a, a surprise. They're going to use... I got, I got one of you yeah. yeah, mine says, um, make sure this memo isn't leaked. So that one... <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think what'll be most interesting, just as it sort of emerges, what actually happened is whether it was carelessness or somehow a malicious act. So um, we'll, oh, okay. we'll just um, we'll see what happens. Well, it worked for them. They won. Maybe they should yeah. leak a memo everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. It could be a the, new tactic. Mm -hmm. The Kangaroos took on Geelong today at, uh, well, Subiaco is the house of pain. Canberra's the house of porn at Marnica <laughs> Oval. And they won pretty comfortably. Three goals in the end after a pretty tight contest most of the day, Sam. Yep. And Lee Harding kicked three for the Kangas. Good return for him. Dean Laidley, I noted, actually said after the game that Sav Rock is at the crossroads at his right. career. Mm. He started on the interchange bench. He did kick one goal, but um, they've got to assess where he's at. Um, Glenn Archer, um, I guess a symbol for the kangaroos in many ways, just because he's so courageous, he actually went down with an ankle injury. Originally thought it was a knee. He's on crutches there, um, but he's rolled it in 
inside, no. which is sort of a bit more um, potentially dangerous. But apparently he was on crutches after the match and saying, oh, I think I might be all right. Yeah, um, yeah he's and I'll be back next week. Yeah. <laughs> but he'll probably have scans tomorrow or Monday and they'll assess well, the Well, surely Dean Laley was happy after the day, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, well, after, yeah. last week's, after last, last week's loss against St Kilda, he was just ropeable. Yeah. Oh, he was yeah. the angriest man I've ever seen. He was angry than the Scott surely, brothers combined. Surely at so today's angry. press conference yeah. he would have been a happy man, wouldn't yeah. he? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They won, of course. We've got some evidence of how happy he was after a great win. This was his press conference. Have a look at him. How important was the win in, in the scheme of things uh, in terms of the ladder? And... Well, you tell me. What sort of questions are that? You tell me. Well, um, if we lost today, you know what? We would be out of the eight. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, if we lost today, we would have been out of the eight. So how, how important do you reckon that is? Yeah, I'm asking you. Yeah, well, I'm asking you. Yeah. I mean, if Dean Laley was that mad, can you imagine how ropeable Neil Danaher must have been? Because Melbourne lost oh, yeah, by yeah, three, yeah. three goals, a bad loss, <laughs> after yeah. the controversial free yeah. kicks. Neil Danaher must have been ropeable. Sure. Yeah. Let's yeah. take a look at how, uh, how mad he was. Oh. <laughs> Throwing that one at me, Owen. Owen. <laughs> 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 he is a character. Uh, what a laugh. He's good. Dane Lally's just an angry man, though, isn't he? Yeah. He's just, he was born angry. Like, his parents used to have looked at his cot just waiting for the first smile. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was, a, it was a high-pressure game, though, yeah. for the Kangas. And mm. as um, yes, as he yeah. said, they needed it to, to give to themselves win. a chance of yep. playing in the finals. Certainly a good win, Sam. And uh, mm. Sam, I know you love going to the football. We all love going to the yeah. football. Checking out, yeah, you love, love it as well. Yeah. You love to check out the banners. <laughs> and, Damon, you saw a banner this week. Which banner did you see? I saw that. I had checked out the Carlton banner, uh, Pete, yeah. which uh, read like this. Our hopes have been dashed of getting Judd the Boy Wonder, so we've offered our starting 22 for David Wirrapunda. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty fair trade, that one. I'll take that one. Carlton. Well, I got a sneak preview of the uh, Richmond banner. Yep. Yes, it was before the game, remember? Once again, our season has resembled a disaster. Well, at least we provide the public with some laughter. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, now they won tonight, so it doesn't really make so much <laughs> <No>. sense. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the Melbourne banner tonight before they ran out, and let's take a look at that. Uh, some players owe bookies. That's not such a sin. They must have stupidly been betting on Melbourne to win. Yeah. Well, yeah. The phenomenon which captivated 60 million viewers worldwide is here and premieres Sunday. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. <laughs> to be an Australian idol, it takes talent, it takes guts. The winner is... No show you've seen is this addictive. Yeah! Nothing has this much emotion. I love you guys! <laughs> and now you can experience the phenomenon. Australian Idol Channel 10. Australian Idol premieres 7.30 Sunday on 10. Somebody did this. For four friends, there's terror around every turn. <laughs> Wrong turn. We're all gonna die. Cut! Something's not quite right. Here, grab a phantom. Julio, let's make this happen. Cue the music! Lights! Phantom! Action! Want to see movies free? Well, grab a Fanta and check out the Mega Movie Fest. Just buy one ticket and use two specially marked Fanta labels to get a friend in free at participating cinemas. Don't miss the Mega Movie Fest. It's gonna be huge! supposed to be doing your homework. Big Pond. Amazing broadband. 
Brad, you're not a rapper. The only way to change him. This is my sizzle for Rizzle. Is to scare the black out. Jamie Kennedy. Don't be hating. Malibu's most wanted. What's up? Have you ever gotten so mad playing footy that you've turned green and ripped your shirt off? <laughs> no. What's going on, Valen Dyke's mallet? Uh, it's disgraceful. Have you ever asked Eddie if you could go on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? <laughs> uh, he's asked me to go on once. Is that right? No. <laughs> <laughs> if Eddie takes over Channel 9, will Anthony Rocker host a current affair? Oh, the old bucks. Have you ever seen Mick Mouldhouse and Paula Curia actually pash? <laughs> uh, at uh, Club 42, do. <laughs> Jason Cloak grow a moustache like his dad's? No. Have you ever seen Nathan Buckley laugh in the football field? Oh, no, or anyway. <laughs> Are you disappointed you didn't make Collingwood's team of the century? <laughs> I thought I was a bit stiff, yeah. Are uh, Richmond a bit crap or totally crap? <laughs> no, no, they're good. Now that Andrew Dimitina is gone, who is the best looking bloke down at Collingwood? Uh, Paul Curio thinks he is. Who has the worst name down at Collingwood? Tarkin, Brody, or Rupert? <laughs> <laughs> Rupert. Have you ever asked Mick if you could take Christy out on a date? <laughs> no. Graham Malloy, not afraid to ask the tough questions we are when they Fourth, go inside yeah. 60. Yeah, now, one of the great games of the year was played tonight at the Gabba. Mm. One versus four. It was a one-point result to Port Power, and this is how it all folded out. They kicked five goals in the last quarter, the Brisbane six, and I think it was Roger James who kicked the point to get them up in the final moment, Sam. Lived up to the hype, didn't it, Peter? And it sounds like quite an incredible encounter. The lead changed seven times in the last quarter. Jonathan Brown apparently outstanding for Brisbane, and uh, Josh Carr kicked four goals. And it was Port. a rough match, and these are some of the bumps, and, and uh, there we go. This is uh, Boss on Pickett. There's some, there's some guys who can hit hard. And uh, Wiki Powder, some skillful goals. Wiki Power on the boundary line That's on nice. his left. He's having a year. Uh, here we go. This is Roger James. A snap on his left from about the same posse. That's a pretty special goal. Yeah. And, and Akamanis. This is, uh, this is, he does that every week, doesn't he? Oh, that is unbelievable. That's the, and this is the uh, the point. He went back for about a minute to go, and he kicked the point. And he just uh, snuck it in. And they, and they won the game. Lee Matthews, of course, was pretty happy about that result. Uh, as you would he had two chances, James, too. He had he kicked the point that drew them, and then kicked the one that... Yeah, he kicked the last two points of the game, basically. He did, yeah. Mm. That's much more succinct. We're yep. going to go to the Gabba now, and uh, we're going to speak to Matty Primus, uh, one of the heroes of the Port Power win. Matty, how are you doing, mate? Yeah, very well, thanks, fellas. Beautiful win, mate. You must be wrapped to go to the Gabba. You, you, on the road this year, you've, you've lost a couple. You've dropped a couple in Melbourne to Geelong and Melbourne to go to the Gabba and beat the Lions. It must be a, an amazing feeling. Yeah, it certainly is. It's a great feeling. As you said, not many teams win up here. Uh, West Coast has had a win up here and they were coming off a loss and uh, people were saying that they were starting to, a few cracks were starting to appear in their team and uh, we knew they were going to come out pretty hard but to get over the line by a point is just a fantastic now, And Matty, watching the game, I saw you and uh, Michael Voss had a bit to say to each other during the game. Did he shake your hand afterwards, mate? Oh, I missed Fossey. He was uh, already coming off the ground. I was on the bench, so uh, I missed him. Right, yeah. Just a huge result in terms of your season, Matthew. I mean, it all but cements your place on top of the ladder, doesn't it? Yeah, it does at the moment. Uh, look, we've still got another tough week against Hawthorne at the G next week. But, um, look, the, the top eight is so close that even the top four is. And uh, those home finals are pretty crucial. And uh, this win's certainly going to help us go yeah, a fair way with that. Mm. Uh, yeah, Matty, uh, you're in the white shorts tonight. You're playing away. Byron Pickett shorts, are they too big? <laughs> yeah, his and Gavin Wanger name's probably both of them, mate. They uh, wear them down near the knees. <laughs> mate, can you give us an insight into your coach? He'd have to be one of the most interesting men in the game. Is he a bit unhinged or what's going on there? <laughs> no, he's, uh, he's pretty intense when the game's on, mate. But uh, yeah. once you get him away from the game, he's nice and cool and calm. But uh, I would hate to be in the box the last couple of minutes tonight. Yeah, so how are you going to celebrate? Do you go to SeaWorld tomorrow? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll go to DreamWorld and my visit Big Brother. <laughs> Fair enough. Go and jump in on the bed. It's be great. <laughs> Peter Burgoy missing tonight. Did you missing up for it? Obviously not. You won by a point. But uh, how did you uh, cover his loss? Oh, look, I think uh, Che Cockatoo Collins did pretty good. He kicked a couple of goals. And, uh, you know, we had a couple of other players there with injury that people really weren't talking about. They were only talking about Brisbane's injuries. But uh, I thought we covered ours pretty good tonight. And you're an experienced player, Matthew. It goes without saying, really. But um, it, does it rate up there with the, the best wins of your career that you've been involved with? 
Uh, yeah, look, it, it's a pretty good one. We uh, haven't won up here for quite a few years, and we've had, I think, a draw, two draws with Brisbane up here. So it's finally good to get over the line with them. And the last couple of years, they've put us out of the finals race. So yeah. uh, it was good to beat them here, but there's still a long way to go in the so, season, and they're certainly going to have a big say in it. Are you going to win the Premiership this year? You've got to win it this year, don't you, Matty? <laughs> Oh, look, we would love to win it, mates, and uh, we're certainly working our butts off, and, and tonight's win will help us uh, to go towards that. Fair enough. Matty Primus, an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Congratulations on a one-point win tonight, and good luck as you march towards the finals. Go to the power. Thanks very much. Good day. Matty Primus there, great win uh, for the boys. Another game Huge that was wins. played today, uh, West Coast versus... Sorry, last, last night, night. Uh, Subiaco. Uh, West Coast Eagles versus Hawthorne. And uh, it was a tight first half. And yeah. then uh, Hawthorne... So I fell asleep at half time. I thought it was going to be a close game, but I fell asleep. But then I woke up right at the end and they'd won they hadn't kicked another goal, Hawthorne. They didn't yeah. kick a goal in well, the second half. Well, I wouldn't half. blame you, Dave. Outscored 62 points to four, the Hawks were. Yeah. And quite interesting. I mean, I kind of monitored the way Hawthorne were looking at it, I suppose, by the fact that they played Shane Crawford, albeit with a big sort of mattress-looking thing around his bruised back. But um, they... Well, he's used yeah. to having a mattress on his back, I guess. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> what do you mean by that, Pete? Well, he, I'm sure he does all right with the ladies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he does, and, and they played like a bad romantic comedy. They completely lost the plot. Yes, <laughs> but he spent um, a lot of the second half of the match on the bench because, um, obviously, he's still feeling the soreness. And Jard was exciting for West Coast, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Signed now again. that he signed, signed for two years. You're, 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 no, there, was word that, there was word that Carlton... Oh, were, no. Obviously, everyone was interested. Yeah, over the line. Yeah, he had the option of, draft pick. He had yeah. the option yeah. of staying in Western Australia with the perfect beaches and the beautiful weather and the beautiful women over there. Or coming to Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. It's, it's a it's, good club. Carlton, no, we're a great club. We're great for them. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> and, of course, there was a... Uh, umpires, Damien, they have an interesting... Uh, Interesting bearing on the games, and they, they do. And they often decide maybe when or when not to pay for a kick. That's right. Um, and sometimes <laughs> they do it. And sometimes they have, they have something to say um, yes. about other players. Well, the, the umpires are aware of their own limitations. That's why they're umpires. Mm. Right. Um, and this is what they said about Ben Cousins. His free kick should be too high, obviously. Sorry, guys. 55 metres out. Yeah. So he didn't pay the free kick because he wasn't going to kick the goal on there. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's what's been brought up there. Welcome to kick one from... 80 that a lot disabled many, many years ago. I'm sure you guys remember that one. But he's probably the only one to do it, though, really. Yeah, yeah. well, Anthony Rock has kicked a few over the years. Jeff Ferry. <laughs> Jeff Ferry. Look, let's list all the goals from outside 60. Yes. Um, beautiful work. Now, um, Sam, uh, yeah. the CEO, talk of CEO, it was supposed to be announced the other day, Andrew Demetrio. Yes. Hasn't got the gig yet. What's going oh, on? Oh, everyone was shocked. I think we were all expecting the big new CEO to be announced oh, on Thursday. I was stunned. And, uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Hasn't they called announced. our bluff. Yes, um, we were all ready, but... No. I was on the internet waiting for it to come through. Well, I'm, I would hope that you would be on <laughs> AFL.com, Dave. But um, no, it's being postponed. Demetrio obviously has got an anxious wait because, you know, everyone's tipped him from the top job. But um, Brian Cook as well. Is he yeah, still there? And Brian Cook's still in the mix. And um, Fong from WA. And there's some mystery great, great yeah, fourth candidate. They talking about that, don't they? Some mystery person from, yeah. from business. Is there it is. Bruce Wayne? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually I know who the mystery person is now, and actually I got a, I got a shot of him. Let's uh, take a look. It's the mystery person they're talking about. Um, should be coming up any oh. moment now. Ooh. Oh, sorry, no, no. So before before we go to the mystery, mate, it's, it's, <laughs> it's such a mystery. I'm going to hold on for a second. Okay. <laughs> Dimitri, uh, he had this to say. He's comparing himself now to Reggie from Big Brother. He's trying to right. get that kind of. He's in touch with the people kind sure. of thing. Yeah. And this is what he had to say uh, uh, during the week. People are being evicted each week, and I thought this week. Gosh, it's, I could be Reggie if I get lucky. For what it's worth, one coincidence, my parents did own a fish and chip shop when I, when I was younger. And I've got my fingers crossed. He's trying to work every angle he can. But back to this mystery man. Yes. <laughs> back to this mystery man. Please. So, well, this yes, I wonder who it is. building man. out way too big now. <laughs> Andrew Demetrio, there's Brian Cook, Robert Fong. But this is a new mystery man who's come into the uh, into contention. <laughs> Yes, oh, and yeah. that's a perfect segue for our favourite <laughs> segment of the show. It's called Sword of the Week. Mark, uh, I think we're about to announce our first uh, dual winner of the tool, uh, Mark Choco Williams. Now he he came out after the Bulldogs game, uh, claiming that the Bulldogs were head hunting. He said some fairly stern words about it. His boys mm. proceeded the next week 
to pretty much do exactly the same thing. Let's just have a look at this tribute to Mark Williams. Well, I thought that they'd come out to headhunters without any doubt about it. Oh. Daft by Burgoyne! Daft by Burgoyne! Daft by Burgoyne! Ah, oh, it's pathetic. You know, you don't do that in footy these days. Oh, chart crunch late by Primus. If you want to play like that, well, uh, I'm sure that the authorities will clean it all up. There it is, from Josh Carr. Initially, when your mates are getting knocked over all the time, you know, there's always the mateship stuff. It's on already in the middle. Bit of pushing and shoving and no surprise there at all. Yeah, it's very much a uh, ugly game. Yours. I don't think we should be cheering that or laughing with that sort of stuff. I'm sure Neil Danaher, what would he think about that? Oh, well. Uh, let's cross to Neil Danaher right now and see what he thinks of that. Oh, dear. Now, it, it's a local award. It, it, it's an Australian award, but we, we've decided to look a little bit outside. Now, there's some uh -huh. people in the world who do some really toolish things, and this week we couldn't ignore... You've probably all seen this footage. The Grand Prix runner. Here he is. International tour. Look at him. <laughs> He's doing everything right. He's dressed up. He's a religious nutter. Look at Dean Ladley really took the loss uh, badly last week, didn't he? He really did. Uh. <laughs> now, I've seen some squeegee guys being determined, but that is just ridiculous. <laughs> so, international tour. Well done, fella. Well done. Monday, Alex is returning to Secret Life. Missed your house party. I'm glad you're back. Why is she back? Is she here to stay? Where's her husband, Rex? You sleep in my bed, I'll go sleep on the couch. I'll see you back there. Oh, uh, Evan. Is Evan about to get another chance with Alex? I've never slept a whole night in this bed before. I've never had a married woman spend the whole night in this bed before. Over three big weeks, your questions will be answered. Presented by McLean's 8.30 Monday, Alex returns to Secret Life. was just a legend. They were dead wrong. Wrong turn. We're gonna die. There's a basic law of nature which says the mightiest will lead. Monaro, game over. It's on now. Sports Bar's amazing mega sale. For four days only, you can buy famous brand sport shoes at up to 50% off. Track suits and sports were up to half price. Up to 70% off top brand tennis and squash rackets. Save up to $800 on the latest health screen treadmills. The latest footballs are crazy $19. There's mega discounts on golf clubs, bags and accessories. Plus, football, soccer, basketball and water sports. Shop smart at Sportsmart. Northcote, Noble Park, Moorabbin. Hurry, mega sale ends 5pm Sunday. Look what's at, Hungry Jack's. Something new on our menu. Hungry Jack's country style chicken. I like that. Country crumb chicken with lettuce and mayo on a long bun. Love it at, Hungry Jack's. The burgers are better at Hungry Jack's. Only Powerade's unique balance of electrolytes and carbohydrates gives you that little bit extra. Did this. For four friends, there's terror around every turn. Wrong turn. We're all gonna die. Hello and welcome back to After the Game. Ruth is just keeping us all on our toes by singing the Brisbane Lions theme song. Congratulations, <laughs> Ruth. You're the only person who knows it in the whole country. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, please welcome our next guest. He's one of the, the silk players uh, who plays at the Melbourne Football Club. He's uh, having a good year. Please welcome Cameron Bruce, everybody. <laughs> I heard, I did hear you described as pure silk. How, how does that, how does, you know, does yeah, that fit? Um, I don't know about that. Today we, uh, 
I had the opportunity to be pretty silky and uh, put a seven points up, but uh, kicked the point, so I suppose that wasn't too silky, was but, it? But your coach was laughing after the game. <laughs> was he laughing like that when he addressed you guys? Hang on, oh, hang on. This is your mark. This is your mark. It was a very good mark under wet conditions, and to be honest, Kim, you weren't that far out. How did that? Uh, that uh, was that must very have hurt. costly. It must have hurt. Very costly, and uh, yeah, Neil wasn't obviously too happy with uh, me missing. But did he um, refer to you? Did he? Talk to you, especially after the game, about that? Yeah, he spoke, uh, went through everyone. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, went through some of the things that we can look to improve on and work on. What's what it like, Cameron, when you say to you? What? Uh, he said, can, uh, can you tell us? Cost yeah. us the game. No, um, just said, uh, you know, it was a pretty costly miss and yeah. um, we, say, we had a run on. Do you say, I know Neil? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, sort, of, I sort of gave an excuse as though the ball was a little bit slippery and you know, that sort of stuff. <laughs> Yes. What's it like when you, you had a good game, I thought, today? What's it like when you, you've had a good game, but you've just made that mistake at the end of the day that kind of, I guess, ruined it a bit? Yeah, it's yeah, obviously a team game, so you want to be doing the, mm. the right thing at yeah. the, when the, the game's in the balance sure. and something that can influence uh, the, the result. So mm. that was obviously disappointing. Mm. Brad Miller, again, was really good, and Steve Armstrong, I think, in the second quarter, you guys had a, a ripper. But um, something Neil did say afterwards is that he doesn't want just cameo roles. Um, he wants mm. consistent performances, great good players but we want you for four quarters is that something that he sort of focused on after the match? Yeah definitely he, it's uh, probably the first time for a while that he's actually gone through every player and right. went through their performance and uh, yeah, he was a bit disappointed with guys that uh, play well for a short amount of time yeah. you know, come on have a burst but then can't maintain it so yeah. that's something that hopefully we can get right in the last five games it's a great opportunity for some of the young guys that are playing for Sandringham in the VFL to um, you know step up and play some then maybe their first uh, AFL game. Mm. How about the, the gambling thing, which was obviously huge in the news this yeah, week? I was just actually mm. wanting you to hurry up the show because I got a tip at uh, the Mooney Valley Trots. <laughs> 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 all the players in Melbourne, are they all no, on the horses? No, I mean, you know, everyone has a punt. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, is it true that Andrew Lee and Shelley was asked to leave because he wouldn't chip in for the syndicate? <laughs> <laughs> Cameron, I don't know if you're across it, but your president, um, Gabrielle Zondi, just hit out at the media um, in that they revealed that it, um, it was Travis um, Johnston and, um, Daniel, and, Ward. and Daniel Ward. The people um, you just named. Yeah. Well, well, he, he <laughs> yes. named them again. Um, odd kind of situation. Is that, you know, as a player, I mean, he was claiming that their privacy was being invaded and their reputations potentially ruined. Yeah, but, well, you know, it's obviously disappointing to, to read that... Um, obviously with Daniel and, and, and Travis. Mm. I mean, it's not a crime to, to have a gamble, is it? So he's, um, I think what, what they get up to is, is their business. Mm. I mean, they're unlikely to hear about it anyway because they'll either be reading the race page or watching Sky TV. <laughs> so. <laughs> I suppose the counter-attack is the whole Carey and Stevens thing. I mean, it's it's not a crime, yeah. but um, it's, it's public, public interest. Property, yeah. Yeah. What's the feeling like at uh, Melbourne, Flea and Chelly now gone? Shane Way Woden left under controversial circumstances uh, last year. Do you feel safe down at Melbourne? Uh, you, obviously, Chell retired, so yeah. that was um, a different circumstance to yeah. Wowie. And, and Wowie's been going really well at Collingwood. They're two great midfielders that, uh, you know, it'd be great to have them in, in, in the side, but it hasn't worked out that way. And, and Chell had a great career, and he's probably one of the classiest guys, you know, on and off the field mm. yeah. you'd ever meet. So I wish Chell all the best in uh, whatever he, he pursues down the track. Um, we all do. <laughs> no, his uh, fiance is a great ballet dancer. So yeah, yeah, that's cool, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. She's off to join the Munich Ballet, is, is that she right? She's the Munich Ballet. The yeah. Munich Ballet. Munich Ballet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the German pronunciation, is it? Yeah. We've seen you all over the ground this year, midfield, kicking six goals and sometimes in defence. Are you looking to kind of settle down somewhere or are you just happy Get to... Get married. Sound, <laughs> sound like <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. Cameron, settle down <laughs> on the halfback flank. It's nice a variety of the spice of life. So. Well, yeah. it is. Yeah, it's, but it's good know. for your longevity, though, oh, to be definitely. able to have all that. Do you get offended being called a small forward? Because you're quite tall. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they're talk talking about. It's small, like... Yeah. Muscle size or a small height, so but because mm. I am a small muscle size right. kind of forward. But uh, <laughs> do you have a girlfriend? Yeah, I do. Ah. What's her name? Julia. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've got one. Oh, do you know? Uh, How do you girlfriend? know? Uh, you talk about it on the radio. I all the do. Time. <laughs> what Beautiful. about some? What about some dirt, Cameron? I mean, you are kind of. You've got this squeaky, kind of clean image. Have, is there anything like you know, bad boy, that you want to unleash here on the program? <laughs> no, yeah, no, I probably prefer not to. <laughs> it's, uh, no. Um, do you, can we make some stuff up there? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it. Have you made some I have a gamble. I have a punt. Yeah, right. so. Oh well. <laughs> 
Well, Cameron, it's, it's, uh, good it's... luck with the virus, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming in. I know it's hard after a loss to come in. We do appreciate yeah. it. Are you going out tonight? Yeah. Are you going to try to catch a cab home with David Neitz at all or anything yeah, like that? No, or... I just get in the car and drive home. Have a I still remember you playing fantastic in a final against Carlton a few years ago. You broke my heart. So. Yeah, that was a, one of our uh, most memorable games. Yeah. So. Well, mm. we'll leave you on that heartbreaking note for Hughesy. Cameron Bruce, we look forward to uh, watching you for the rest of the year yeah. and many years to come at the Melbourne Football Club. You're a pleasure to watch. Cameron Bruce, everybody! <laughs> He goes where no other host will go. That's your only vice, isn't it, chocolate? Well, chocolate and bondage. <laughs> Tuesday on Road, Latino superstar Ricky Martin, Clive James and Dennis Lilly. <laughs> <laughs> Road Live, 9.30 Tuesday. Smirnoff Ice Double Black. A sharper bite for a sharper drinker. Hi, I'm Bob Thorne, Managing Director of Super Cheap Auto. And with Marlowe's on board, we'll bring you Australia's biggest range of quality auto parts, accessories, handyman items, tools and equipment. You'll get the lawful Yep, that's right. With amazing value like Superfit Sheepskin Seat Covers, only $49 a pair, save 40 bucks. A handy car polisher, just $29, save $20. And this boat bitch, just $99, save an amazing 90 bucks. Super Cheap Auto. Welcome to Value. An elite crime-fighting unit in turmoil. Zero competence unit's latest public relations fiasco. Okie dokie, Mrs P. Leave it with us. Those three disasters have been taken completely out of context. Oh, you're the good guys. We're with the good guys, yes. Mick Malloy, Bob Franklin, Judith Lucy, Bad Eggs. Uh, my, I think you might be hugging the curb just a tad, mate. A bottle of milk, thanks. Low fat, no fat, full cream, high calcium, high protein soy, light skim, omega-3, high calcium with vitamin D and folate or extra dollop. Uh, uh, I just want milk to taste like real milk. This tastes like full cream milk. And only 2% fat. Paul's Smarter White Milk. Smart choice. It was just a legend. They were dead wrong. Wrong turn. We're all gonna die. Nine o'clock next Sunday. Are you ready to rock? The biggest names in Aussie comedy come together in aid of cancer research. <laughs> a night you'll cry laughing. For Holly, nine o'clock next Sunday on 10. <laughs> Welcome back to After the Game. Let's get straight into it. Some big games tomorrow. Nathan Buckley plays his 200th game mm. as Collingwood take on Carlton yeah. uh, tomorrow at the MCG. And Dave uh. and <laughs> Sam, I know you're Carlton supporters, but I have never been more confident going into a Collingwood-Carlton game well, in my life. What odds are you going to give us? What odds? What, what, you name them. What do you, what do you, what I do want? I want 100 to 1. Oh, you, you've got it. You've got right, it. I'm putting a dollar on. Okay, done, done. I'll put a dollar that Brendan Favola will match the five goals he kicked against you boys last time. And Saturday uh, night Favola. Oh, care. yeah. Well, you don't care. Don't Fantastic. Care. Right. Well, let's move along. Sydney play <laughs> Fremantle tomorrow at the SCG. This should be a great one. It's an mm. important game in the makeup of the final eight. Who's Barry mm. Hall going to headbutt this week? <laughs> well, <laughs> now, indeed. We're, we're all big fans of Chris Connolly, aren't we? Oh, we yeah. love him. We love it. He's, he's taking over from Dennis Pagan because he says stuff like this. Chris Connolly, we saw you in the coach's box. The anxiety, the tension, that was another wonderful victory. Yeah, I'm just uh, finishing off a minty, but uh, <laughs> we're really proud of the players. Why'd you tell us that? Yeah. He thinks he's at the movies. He has choc tops at half time or something. <laughs> I've never heard that statement before in my life. I'm just finishing off a minty. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how Freo respond from that one point um, game. Mm. Subiaco mm. last week. Yeah. Yeah. And the final game, finishing off the round, Adelaide play St Kilda at Amy Stadium in a game that you would think Adelaide should win comfortably. Mm. Well, that's if St Kilda get there. And also Wayne Carey's out. <laughs> Wayne Carey's out? Yeah, he had a private training session this morning not pulled up he's well. He's already calls it. Mm. Well apparently he was alright but um, they're giving they're giving his um, knee one more week to mm. heal. Mm. Alright. Mm. His gash knee. Wonder, we could hang out with Steve Lawrence. 
Perhaps. <laughs> well, he was going to be driving the team bus. That's why I was worried they won't get there. <laughs> it's his week. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, well, we want to thank the guests that we had on the show. We had uh, Jared Whaley and Mark Coglin joining us from Telstra Dome. We had Matty Primus uh, from the Gabba. And uh, clap whenever you like, guys, because these guys are great footballers. Um, <laughs> Jared Malloy joined us as well. Cameron Bruce joined us. He came right into the studio for the Melbourne Football Club after a loss. So great work, Damien. Thank you. Fusey, thank you. Thank you. Sam from AFL.com. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week on After the Game. Hope your team wins. Certainly, I hope mine wins tomorrow. Go to the Monty Pies. Dear Di, my dad was a really admired player down here at Collingwood and it's great to see Alan Dardak showing his respect by growing a mullet. Now all he needs is a giant moustache. Scotty Burns, well he has been a great player for us this year. The opposition teams rarely notice him as he racks up the possessions. And to be honest, we rarely notice him either. We always leave for interstate trips without him. And the other night, he was locked in the club rooms after training. I love playing with Bucks, but it's in my contract, I have to say that. <laughs> it really is a family affair for me at Collingwood. My younger brother plays here as well, and my sister is also here. Once, we cut her hair, put stubbles on her face, and she played as Shane Wakeland when he was injured. <laughs> Better get to sleep. Eddie's got me working overtime at the moment. It's my turn to write the questions for Millionaire this week. Until next time, Jason Cloak. I'm going to do Dad proud tomorrow. Updating sports tonight, Port Adelaide has scored a heart-stopping one-point win over the Brisbane Lions at the Gabba. Richmond's eight-game losing streak is over, whipping the Bulldogs by ten goals. The Kangaroos still in the eight after defeating Geelong, Essendon outlasting Melbourne by 17 points. The Wallabies have suffered their second worst rugby loss to New Zealand in the professional era, crashed 50 to 21 in Sydney. And that completes the humiliation. Manly has scored an upset 26 to 20 NRL win over the Broncos at Suncorp Stadium. Parramatta crushing the Dragons 36 to 10. Two tries from Billy Slater helping Melbourne defeat South 24 to 6. A double century stand between Darren Lehman and Steve Waugh has put Australia in a dominant position in the second test against Bangladesh in Cairns. For all the latest, tune in to tomorrow's early edition of Sports Tonight at 5.30. Want Hollywood idols? Nine o'clock Sunday, three Hollywood hotties in a unique flick about love, life and all its little ups and downs. Performances, including the one Angelina grabbed an Oscar for. Girl Interrupted, special time, 9 o'clock Sunday. Escape from L.A. is classified M and is recommended for viewing by mature audiences. It contains some violence and some coarse language.